feel free to stop me and correct me if any of this is wrong, okay? I don't think I'm at that level to do that. <laughs> <Come on>. so. <laughs> All right. This is Laura London, and you're listening to a special quarantine edition of Speaking of Young. Joining us for the third edition in this series is the creator and host of the Mind's Eye show, Mr. Brian Turnoff in Baltimore, Maryland. He holds a degree in childhood education from Hunter College in New York City and taught for many years in the state's school system. His past professional experiences include stints as a DJ and as a promotions director for a top 20 market radio station. Since 2009, Brian has been moonlighting as a paranormal investigator and researcher with Shadows of the Paranormal. Their mission is to discover their mission is to discover the truth behind paranormal claims and to help people in need. In 2012, he launched their weekly radio show, Misguided Souls. As producer and co-host, he took the position of resident skeptic, initially intrigued by a personal search for the existence of spirits based on a deep fear of death. His mission, after numerous years of investigating, is to assist people in need and to find tangible proof of life after life. Utilizing these practices, he has conducted lectures and workshops about various paranormal and non-paranormal topics at public libraries and schools along the East Coast. Brian is best known as DJ BJ Turnoff, (laughs) host of the long-running podcast, The Mind's Eye. Created in 2014, the show thoughtfully examines wide-ranging topics with a focus on cutting-edge scientific theories, current and historical events, morality and politics, as well as pop culture and the esoteric. His guests include the late Dr. Stanton Friedman, Robert Buval, Rick Strassman, Nick Redfern, Robert Schock, and our friend Jimmy Church. With his characteristic open-minded perspective, Brian often veers listeners into new and unexpected territories. As an experienced secondary school teacher, he is intimately aware of how history is written by the winners through educational gaps and disinformation ultimately blurring the lines between reality and fiction. By shining a light on the hidden, often dirty crevices of history, the show hopes to find kernels of truth and give voice to the voiceless. The Mind's Eye can be heard every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, on Stitcher Radio and ZTalk Radio. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, May 20th, 2020, through the magic of Skype. Hi, Brian. Hello, hello. Uh, And anyone who out there who's doubting my name is actually BJ uh, Turnoff. I got a license that proves you otherwise. That is my actual real name. Your real Uh, name is BJ. That my BJ Turnoff. That is when you, when you're born with a name like that, you have to, I guess, be born with a, a bit of a sense of humor for sure. So, it's Turnoff or turn off. It's really turn off, but at with this a point, v. yeah. But did you guys well, change the F, spelling? It's one F, but it, it well, it used to be Turnovsky. Uh, and then when my family went through the port of Philadelphia, they didn't go through Ellis Island. Okay. Um, it was changed then to Turnoff. It's uh, Polish. It's Polish. But here's the here's actually a funny little thing, which I was told yeah. whether this story is true or not, a little family story, is that our name once was Crystal, uh, and this was in Poland. What? But one of my family members uh, married into a family that only had uh, daughters. Uh, so he took their last name, Turnovsky, uh, which then eventually became Turnov, uh, and here I am, BJ Turnov. <laughs> Got it. Wait, Crystal? Crystal, Yeah. That okay. used to be, or, or it's, it's, it's from what I'm told, that's what it was. Okay. So, and BJ, so Brian Crystal, I mean, God damn, that's, that's a name and a half for, for a podcast. But you know what? DJ BJ Turnoff works for me and it kind of works for what I'm doing here. I love it. I love it. So we are both native New Yorkers and yeah, it yeah. takes one to know one baby. <laughs> it takes right? one asshole to know, to know another <laughs> exactly, asshole. Right? Exactly. And so I have to squash that, hide that, not only because I live in Chicago, which is my adopted hometown. I've only been here, well, I've been here actually for 16 years, which is a long time. But 
I am a native New Yorker. You know, my parents both grew up in New York City. My brother and I were born there. We grew up there. And where exactly were you born? Uh, Plainview. So uh, I'm a Long Island boy. Uh, what, what, what about you? Well, I was what? born in Queens. Oh, Queens girl we got here. Yeah, what, Jackson Heights. Okay, yeah, yeah. And you know, here's a kind of a funny thing that people don't realize. Uh-huh. Um, Brooklyn, Queens, uh, Nassau, Suffolk County, that's mm-hmm. actually all part of Long Island. Yeah. That's all part of, yeah, a lot of people, when they think, of, they don't really realize that when I tell them that, they're kind of shocked. But, you know, talking to another New Yorker that's, you know, been there, done that type of information. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so, so how'd you make your way out to uh, Chicago? Oh, long story. My dad, my dad's job, he was an executive and he kept getting job changes and promotions. And so, I, I mean, I, I traveled a lot because of that, which was great. I've been flying since I was thinking about this because of the this lockdown that we're all in. I haven't flown since February. And that's not typically how I live. Um, I'm used to traveling a lot. And that's pretty much been the hardest part. Uh, I've been flying since I was a young child. So, um, yeah, I live my life vicariously through you with all your travels. Oh, I'm just like, what? oh, she's there. I'm like, oh, that <laughs> looks really nice. I should probably go there too at well, some point. So. It's weird because some people have a reaction to it like, oh, w- wow, you get to do that. And to me, it's natural because I've been doing it since I was a child. You yeah, know, a way and of life. It, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it is a way of life. And, and um, it's nothing, it's no big deal. It, in fact, feels strange to not be flying. I, I don't like to be in one place for too long. Um, so you are in Baltimore. That is true. I, I, I lived here many moons ago and then I, I ended up moving back uh, about almost two years now at this point. I'm, you know, it's Charm City and, you know, it's Charm kind of kind of worked on me, although for some people, uh, not not quite, but I'm, I'm a big fan of Baltimore. I love I think Baltimore. It gets a lot of sh- I think it gets a lot of shit. And a lot of it is deserved. I'm not going to lie. Um, but uh, some of it is not deserved. And it really is a, a really great city. And, and the people that inhabit it, um, unique. And, and there is a sense of community here, whether the media um, you would watch otherwise make you think otherwise. I have not actually heard anything negative about Baltimore. I went there as a well, child. Well, the murder is just, uh, oh. I mean, the murder rate is ridiculous. I'm not oh. going to There's no way I can say anything but that. Is that, that right? But, worse yeah, than Chicago? Yeah, I mean, Chicago? lots of gangs and, and uh, oh. worse than Chicago. I, I, you know, I don't know the statistics there, um, but the murder rate here is, is, is pretty rough um, for the uh, amount of population there is at least. Oh, I'm Having sorry said that, that. Um, you know, uh, I don't want to, you know, shine a negative light on it. I think for, Baltimore is, a, is an absolutely wonderful city, and I would recommend anyone to move here. So. There is something called, I can't remember now, because I went there when I was a kid, Harbor Place. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's right on the harbor. It's, right? it's called yep. Harbor Place. They're not trying to trick anybody. Yep. And, and, and I had a wonderful experience there where I think my dad adopted a dolphin for me or something. This was a huh. long time ago. And then Baltimore is home to Charm City Cakes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Duff Goldman's Bakery, uh, the original one. I guess they've opened more branches now all over the country. Have you ever been there? I have not, although, of course, I've I've heard good things. Heard good things. And uh, our friend Robert W. Sullivan IV lives in Baltimore. Yes. Yes, and both of our friends actually. We, I think we, 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 I've interviewed him a couple times uh, about a couple of his books. So, so you are both, and I neglected to include this in the intro. You are both Freemasons, and I want <laughs> to talk about you. I'm grabbing this book because I lost my notes. Being a Freemason because Jung's grandfather was a Freemason, hmm. and I want you to tell us a little bit about what that means, what that is. Well, I mean, I think what prompted me to to want to look into being a Freemason is I'm a big history lover, so mm-hmm. uh, particularly American history. I mean, I'm born in USA, so how you know, it's it's what I like. Yeah. Um, and as probably a lot of people know, a lot of listeners, a, a good amount of the presidents were Masons, and I was wondering, yeah. well, 
why are so many presidents, people who are considered, you know, leaders of the free world, why are they Masons? And um, I mean, on side note, I mean, who doesn't also want to be in a secret society? Let's let's be serious right. here. It's, it's right. kind of cool just saying it. Uh, but, you know, really looking into into it, because none of my family members were Freemasons that I'm aware of, okay. um, is that their beliefs really kind of align with with my beliefs, diversity, acceptance, mm-hmm. equality. Uh, and there's this phrase in Freemasonry it, it, on the level, and it shows you equality. It means no matter where you are in your status in life, uh, we are all the same. So you could be president or you could be janitor, right? But you're still the same when you're uh, wherever you are, you're, you're equal. And there's this like really cool Freemason legend and whether it's true or not, it's uh, it's exactly that, right? So there's uh, the president of the United States. He's a Freemason, uh, one of the presidents in the 20th century. There's also a janitor uh, in the for the White House. They're both Freemasons at the same lodge and they're at a lodge meeting together. Uh, but the janitor is, you know, worshipful master or, you know, some other position that is really really high. And the president is just, you know, is not one of those high positions. Uh, But there are certain times during meetings that, you know, you kind of have this act of reverence that you you do for someone in a position. And the president had no problem doing that with the janitor. So, yeah. So and and whether that's true or not, who knows? But it's, you know, it's kind of a microcosm of the belief system that I'm particularly interested with, um, Freemasons and, and what made me want to join. So I joined in 2009. I'm kind of a small fries guy, uh, third degree master Mason, which is pretty much, you know, the, the, the basic thing that you can do. Um, and the reason for that is I joined in 2009. I was living in Maryland at the time. And about two months after I got in, uh, I got offered a job in New York. So then I moved to New York. Uh, I moved around a bunch of times. I was in Brooklyn, Long Island, then I moved to Los Angeles. I moved around there once a year. So literally once a year, I moved for a, the last 10 years or so. Uh, and it's really hard to pursue your degree work uh, to advance in it if you can't go to any meetings. Um, so I'm a small fries guy, like I said, Master Mason. But the way I continuously and today interact and um look into Freemasonry and connect with it is I do a lot of historical research and some of that is Masonic related. So yeah, I'm a Freemason. I love the history behind it. I love the, you know, occult um, information, the, the hidden information that they reveal to you, yeah. um, even though mine is obviously very minimal. Um, so it's, I think it's pretty interesting. Um, and you said before that Young was, uh, grandfather was a Freemason. And, you know, at that time, Freemasonry was really a fabric of people's lives. And, you know, Young to me, from the outside looking, I mean, to me, he looks like a perfect candidate to be a Freemason. Why is that something that he never pursued himself? Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know. Uh, probably because he didn't have the time, but I, I, I have no way of knowing. So it was his father's father. So and his name was Carl Gustav Jung. And hmm. they kind of jokingly refer to him as C.G. Jung the first. Mm. Um, because Jung's the OG. name, what do you mean? <laughs> the original gangster. The original. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. Yeah. <laughs> so the name skipped the generation. So it was his grandfather's name. It's his name. And yeah, he was this larger than life figure. And I have so many questions I want to ask you about it because I compiled my own list of Jung and the number 13. But before mm. I tell you about that, I'd like to know um, why – so you stopped at the third degree. First of all, why is it called Freemason? Because you also referred to it as being a mason. So- uh, it's just uh, vernacular. It's just they're, – they're both just the terms for it. Uh, mason is just a short term for, for Freemasonry. So um, is there a difference between a Freemason and a mason? No, not at all. They're no. just It's just uh, – depending on the word that you want to use. Okay. Uh, so when I say, say Masonic every time, I'll say, you know, free Masonic, you know, Freemasonry or Masonic, just to switch up the word. It's just vernacular terminology, It's it, but they mean the same exact thing. Well, now they don't, um, sorry, can you hear this? I'm messing with my pop filter because I finally got a pop filter because I'm popping my peas and it's falling apart. Sure, um, I hear filter. you messing with something now. Before you said that, I didn't notice it, no. Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay, so... No, you're fine. Hey, so, editing. God, gotta love it. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Freemason. So 
you also refer to it as a secret society. And I'm wondering how secretive is it if everybody knows about it? Yeah, it's the worst kept secret in, in the world right, right now. Um, the thing is, is that not everything is revealed, right? So, right. I mean, you could find, <laughs> like I said, I'm a small fries guy, third degree mason. You can literally find every single degree, first, second, third degree, up until the third degree, somewhere online. You can know exactly what the rituals were. Having said that, you don't get the interpretation from the masons themselves um, uh, just by reading it online. So it's the worst kept secret, but even though they tell you the con, you can know the content, but the content, but you may not actually know the content unless you're really within it. So kind of like in, in some ways it's kind of like the, the Bible, at least how I view the Bible. And mm -hmm. I don't want to turn off half the listeners here, but to me, it seems like a collection of stories that has truth in it, but it's there to teach you a lesson. And that's essentially what Freemasonry is. It's, it's, it's nonfiction within a work of fiction to teach you something. And I'm sure you know, it has such a negative connotation. I mean, like there's this cloud over it where if someone's a Mason, then they are not to be trusted. They're evil. And it's the exact opposite, mm. right? It's the it, opposite. It's They're the best people I have met. And Oh, there's so many questions I have. But first of all, they don't allow women. And if they did, I would definitely join. <laughs> and you'd be more than welcome to. We'd love to have you. I mean, there's offshoots um, that are female related to it and have female members. Uh, but yeah, it's not quite the same thing. It's not the same. I know Robert Sullivan was telling me about that. I think they're daughters of the Eastern of a Revolution. Star, yeah, daughters, daughters of the, of the Revolution. Star. Yeah, exactly. But it's not the same thing. And I'd be the first to admit it. And uh, and for for someone who believes in equality and and I was I was saying before how that was such a huge belief system and I'm embarrassed for Freemasonry for that now at this point. For I, I think I think we could like you know so we have the Constitution right and then we have like the amendment you know there's on um, the Elastic Clause which allows you to change it with the, the with the times. Right. We too have to change with the times and I don't think there's any reason why we can't have females there right now and maybe that's a. Uh, uh, a controversial point of view within Freemasonry. I don't know. It's not really, to me, it's not really discussed, but I'm also not, like I said, I'm not really in it that much um, within the circles, within the circles. But yeah, I mean, I think that females should be part of it, actually, mm -hmm. quite frankly. So. so you don't continue to go to meetings and... No, I, I don't go to it just because, you know, it's, I've literally, if over the last 11 years, I have moved once a year. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I can go from Brooklyn to Long Island. Then I went from Long Island to L.A. And then I moved to about four different places in a span of three years or so in L.A. So it's really hard to to do that when your life isn't settled. So that's why nowadays um, Freemasons, a lot of the lodges are comprised of the majority of them are older people. A hundred years right. ago, Freemasonry, um, it was a young man's game because that was the fabric of life. Um, mm. That was a, that was part of their life. Um, you, and, you know, just because it was a different time then. Uh, they that would, but now it really is kind of an old man's game. Not everybody's old, but it, the majority of them, like I said, are. So, you know, when life settles a little bit more, you're for you know another another few years, and when I'm a little bit more settled, I plan on continuing the the degree work. But for right now, it's mm -hmm. it's not a a weekly thing in it. I engaging it, I engage in it by doing the research that's related to Freemasonry. You do the research, and if for your own personal. Um interest and for yeah, the show for, for pleasure and a way to feel connected and not to feel like a complete piece of shit for not continuing my degree work <laughs> so Jung, uh his father it said that he became... although i let me let me add this okay. in. i apologize i'm still i'm an active member i i pay um my dues every single year since then so i'm still an active member i'm not active in the sense that i'm continuing my degree work Okay, but you and that just made me feel better just saying that that wasn't oh, good. that wasn't for you. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, great. I apologize. What you were saying, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, there. that's okay. That's all right. So I was just reading about Jung's father. It said that um, not, I'm going to skip over all of this, and that it said he later became the rector of the university and a grand master of the Swiss Lodge of Freemasons, and he opened a he was a physician. I'm sorry, neglected to mention that. And he created a psychiatric clinic for children, 
Uh, in, this was in, back in 1857. He founded the Home of Good Hope for retarded children. Hmm. And then he later wow. became the rector uh, of the university and a grandmaster. So the reason why I brought up the number 13 is because Robert Sullivan alerted me to that. Is there some significance to that in Freemasonry, the number 13? I'm not aware of it, but um, what did Robert Sullivan say about the number 13 he, yeah. and within Freemasonry? I think he, if, if I remember correctly, he tied it into the Friday the 13th and why and oh, how. Okay, yeah, that's what I was going to say okay. because, you know, Freemasonry is considered to be an offshoot of uh, the Knights Templar. They might be, or you know, our, our forefathers, so to speak, in some way. Some people believe that. Um, so the number Do 13. Do you not believe that? I think it's it's definitely a possibility. I, I I think that might be something that you learn later on at some point, which is maybe reason why it's believed. Um, but there is some overlapping um, evidence that that there might be a connection there, um, particularly with you know maybe some ritual work or or, or something like that. Okay. But with you know with Friday the Thirteenth. Um, so Knights Templars are considered to be, you know, maybe our forefathers. And so the Knights Templar, yeah. um, they were, uh, for those listeners not familiar, they were a Catholic military order. Uh, they defended the kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, they protected Christians uh, who were go- doing their pilgrimage. And this was during the Crusades time. Uh, they were founded, I think, in the early 11, you know, um, 11, it was 11, yeah. 19, I think it was something, something to that. And then pretty much over the next two centuries, they amassed a ridiculous amount of wealth and land. And when you amass a, a ridiculous amount of wealth and land, someone's going to want to come for it. And that's exactly what I think King <laughs> Philip, the, the ninth or 10th, something, I think it was the ninth, um, who, who did exactly that. And at that time, if you wanted to, uh, attack somebody uh, and to justify your actions of killing and torturing them, pretty much all you had to say was heresy, magic, and that's pretty much what he did. Uh, so he was able. So on Friday the thirteenth, thirteen oh seven, another part of the thirteen right there. Uh, Friday the thirteenth, thirteen oh seven. That was the day a large amount, or supposedly a large amount, of Knights Templars uh, were apprehended and then you know, subsequently and then um, killed there afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I think actually think that uh, just to go with like, you mm-hmm. know, the 13 thing, mm-hmm. um, people, that's why Friday the 13th is considered bad luck. I actually think there's another reason why 13th, thir- the number 13 is considered bad luck with a historical event. Oh, tell me. Um, so Jesus Christ, right? Uh, 12 apostles, the last supper. So 12 apostles, Jesus Christ, uh, he was one, 12 plus one, 13 last supper. We all know what happened from there. Right. Uh, so I think that there might be some relationship there to a reason why we, you know, why there's so much superstitions over 13. I mean, it's such a, such an interesting number. I mean, 13 it and is. why there's so many superstitions. I mean, we make these accommodations for the number 13 and the superstition. So right. listeners, if, uh, I want listeners, if you, people, particularly in cities, if you go into buildings that are 13 floors plus t- and you're on the elevator, take a look at the elevator. You might see, uh, that the number 13 isn't actually depicted on the elevator. You'll see 12A, you'll see 12B, but you won't see the number 13. Right. Um, and then also, I think, with the number 13, that with buildings, because I used to be a home inspector and a business inspector, there are actually are a lot of floors. Uh, the 13th floor is a lot of times used as a mechanical floor. They won't put like an actual office on there. So it's interesting with the number 13, how we make um, accommodations for these interesting, super, you know, these superstitions. Yeah, in present day. Yeah. Does the number 13 have any importance to you, yourself? I like it, and I, I've i always liked it. Uh, if there are any BTS Army listening, I know it's a very important number to Jimin and Jungkook. But I've been compiling a list as regards to Jung and how many times the number 13 showed up when I was reading his biography um, and again, this came from Robert Sullivan, um, him, he alerting me. And you've had Robert Sullivan on your show a couple times. Mm-hmm. He no, wrote, no, I think our conversation was probably a little different than yours. <laughs> what do you mean? How so? Uh, well, I imagine you had some uh, more young focused while mine was more just, you know, cinema, oh, no, we symbolism didn't, he and free mind. Uh, right, free right. He wasn't on the podcast. We just became friends. Um, oh, just buddy, buddy. Yeah, we just became friends. And I think so. 
here's another thing I didn't mention. I was a guest on your show. Yes, yes. One of my favorite episodes. Oh, gosh. Back in 2016, it was February 11th, Ah. 2016, and it was less than a year after I started speaking of Jung. And I have no idea what I said on that episode. I probably didn't know what I was talking about. All I remember is panicking because you asked me to define the collective unconscious and I couldn't. That's the only thing I remember. You were Uh. so nice to me. You were so kind. But I think that you might have invited me on the show because of our mutual friendship with Rob. No, not at all. I didn't even know that you guys were friends. Oh. No, because you honestly, I think what it was is that you followed me on one of my social media pages and and you just reached out saying hey i like your podcast and um quite frankly i think you were one of the first if not the first person to ever do that so um and i then you started your podcast and yeah and i was like wow that's really fascinating and i always wanted to do a topic on young and and some of his beliefs and it it just worked out well so yeah no i I had no clue that you were friends with rob well thank you for for having me as a guest it was i think this only the second time i had ever been a guest and i don't know that i knew what i was talking about um you're way too hypercritical of yourself. i I love doing it i love doing it and thank you and we got to have you on again by the way that would be fun you always have an open door to to talk about anything that 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 you want but uh when you have your own podcast, I guess you don't really need to go on other people's podcasts. No, I love it because I don't get to talk on my podcast, right? I don't get to talk on my podcast. So well, you have a lot of great guests and they have a lot of great things to say and you only have a limited, limited yes, amount of time to do that. Yes, and it's not right? about so, me. Yeah, when I do- And that's my, what, right. That's exactly right. right. It's not about us. Um, you know, we, we, we can, that's, can, this is my perspective as host, right? Uh-huh. I, I just want to ask the questions that people want to, to know. I ask yep. the questions that the, the listeners want to ask and then I just kind of get out of the way. Yep. That's it. And I'm learning the more. And so this is weird for me trying to, you know, expand upon stuff and, and talking from the other side. But, you know, I've always tried to just kind of ask the questions, get out of the way. And that's, mm-hmm. that's really it. So, and I've had to like work a lot to, um, you know, if I listen to my first shows, I'll, I'll say 400 things before I ask the fir- the question. Uh, now yeah. I just, just get to the question, you know, keep yeah. it simple, stupid. <laughs> oh, well, you're very diplomatic and you're very kind. I um, tend to be a little bit more blunt. And so when I said I don't get to talk, that I meant that uh, it's when I do speaking of Jung, it's not about me. It's about the guest. Mm. So I try not to share my opinions or mm-hmm. it's not about what I know. I just want to give them the floor and let them talk. So... It's We're, interesting that you bring that up because okay. I'll get people on certain – so I talk about pretty hot-button topics yeah. and, and a lot of times people will fall one way or the other. Uh, so when I talk about these hot-button topics, um, I'll always get these comments like, what is this, a commercial for this, for whatever it is? You know, I did something on stem cells and it happened to talk about how, um, you know – Using fetal, using fetal thing, you know, fetal stem cells, which is controversial, is bad. Uh, so someone just said, "What are you a commercial for using fetal stem cell?" And no, that's not it. I just brought the person on. They had something to say about it. I'm not going to argue with someone. I'll ask the hard questions. I'll ask the questions that the other side wants to hear. But I'm not going to argue with them, and I'm not right. going to make it negative. And I think people misinterpret that as saying, "No, you're advertising for something." Um, and because I don't say my opinion, even if I disagree with it, that kind of probably causes it. So I can I understand that for sure. Um, and it's it's tough being a host sometimes, you know. <laughs> sometimes yeah. you want to say something, and, and you don't know how it's going to come off, right? Right, and I don't want to debate my guests or disagree with them. I don't really care. Uh, if they say something that I don't agree with. It's about them and their thoughts and their beliefs and their ideas. And I want to hear it all. I want to hear what everybody has to say. And if I don't agree with it, I'm not going to tell them that because it's not about my opinion. Uh, It's the show is about them. And I don't have to agree with them. And if I don't agree with them, it doesn't matter. Yeah. There's room for everybody's exactly. stance, everybody's opinion, everybody's thoughts. Let's just make room for all of it. And we, I, I like having friends who are different religions and different political affiliations and different races and different everything. It makes life interesting. 
right? Oh, for sure. And I think, you know, what we need now is more calm dialogue, right? Uh, I mean, that's what's really going to propel us forward. I mean, you can't learn anything when somebody's yelling at your face, um, even if you have a different yeah. opinion. So on my show, you know, we debate. I have differences, opinions with my guests. I express them. But, I, you know, people will misinterpret that if you don't yell at them with these, oh. uh, you know, different perspectives. And they'll say, you know, they, they pretend like you're not saying you're still debating them. So, you know, just because I, I think just because you don't have to you don't have to yell at someone to disagree with them and debate them. There's mm-hmm. there's there's white way. And I think my show does that. And I when we're particularly with those type of topics. Mm-hmm. So, but it's yeah. tough. It's really tough. It's really tough. It is. It is. And I like to provoke thought. So in the silence, I think it allow it gives room. It allows room for thought instead of constant back and forth to just make a lot of space for it. But I don't want to let this go about Jung and the number 13 Mm. because Mm -hmm. I made this list and I want to hear your opinion. So C.G. Jung I, his paternal grandfather, had 13 children with three different wives. Jung's father, C.G. Jung I's son, was born during his third marriage. And the guy, the paternal grandfather, spent 13 months in prison. Okay. Jung's maternal grandfather had 13 children. So Jung's paternal grandfather had 13 children and his maternal grandfather had 13 children. The youngest was Jung's mother, Emily. Okay. You with me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. And fascinated. The first time they met, Jung and Freud spent 13 hours hours talking. Okay, every account of that meeting mentions the number 13. It mentions the number of hours, 13. Why? Can't they just said, oh, say they, they spent a lot of time talking or they talked into the night? Why is it always specified the number of hours that Jung and Freud spent together in their first meeting? 13 hours. They ended their relationship in 1913. Okay, another point. Jung reviewed 1,300 of Wolfgang Pauli's dreams. That's in the book Adam and Archetype, edited by Jung's friend C.A. Meyer, who was a physician and a Jungian analyst. 1,300 dreams. Okay, in 1913, Jung began work on the Red Book. It was a very pivotal year for him. Last one. There's a 13-year age difference between Jung and Tony Wolf, who was his colleague and his quote-unquote mistress, with whom he worked for 33 years. End of list. What did Jung think about the number 13? I don't know. I don't know. I don't I don't think he said anything about the number 13. Huh. I mean, I have his collected works. So that I really, it's, it's, it's people that are researching Jung that say this number was prevalent, no, prevalent I, in his life. No, I noticed it. I don't, mm. I don't know anybody huh. else bringing it up. Well, what do you up. think then? Why, I mean, why, I mean, what do you think about the number 13? Why, why does it keep coming up in his life? And, and why is it, I mean, why is it important? I mean, what, what, do you think, what do you think about the number? So What's your impression? This is one of my topics of interest that I think about and look into every day, and I still don't have any answers. Mm. So it's one of the things that keeps me going. My, right now, do you know who Richard C. Hoagland is? Uh, yes, he's uh, space related, right? Kind of, yeah. He he is a very controversial figure. I was, uh, last summer, I was an associate producer of his for his show. It's called The Other Side of Midnight because his producer had to step away for a while. And I stepped in and I actually uh, did a couple, I filled in as host of the show a couple times and, and I actually you, and you never told me this what the hell oh you didn't know no so Hoagland what the hell okay listen so when Art Bell left I'll piss at you now. okay let's start at the top <laughs> okay I'm gonna fill you in so when yeah. Art Bell left Coast to Coast AM he retired then he came back and then he mm-hmm. retired again right he started a show on Sirius XM radio called was it called Midnight, Midnight in the, in the Desert right? uh, Midnight, Midnight in the Desert our desert, right. Oh, right. and we didn't talk about your theme music, which I was listening to 
before uh, let's, this started. You're going to have to edit that out. We, we can't talk about that. We can't talk about it. Oh, no, because then on YouTube, I started getting these copyright things, even though I bought it for, uh, and then he started like, you know, uh, oh, someone started to no. come. So it's, it's, I don't even, I haven't even used it in, in uh, two years, probably plus. Love that song. Okay, I know. It's so out. good. Damn. So, I love that song. I know. Song. I know. I mean, I can find it who it is. Oh, that's what, you know, that's what you messaged me about. You're like, oh, I love your cross. Oh, I love the opening. God, that's what I me. love that. Yeah, I you weren't complimenting me just... on my actual content. You were you were saying, oh, hey, I love your Brian, opening. Brian, <laughs> come on. You picked it. <laughs> yes. No, no. But uh, I agree. It was a good one. But yeah, unfortunately, I mean, we could talk about it. You can keep this right now. But, uh, uh, but when yeah, I, I don't, hear I don't just even the first few bars of that song, I just, I'm gone. Oh, it's so good. So good. Okay. So I should, I should, I should speak to the person, tell them to just give it to me. Yeah. So, or have you speak to them for me? I definitely will. I will stand up for you. I had a really hard time finding a song for my show. Um, but the guy whose song it is, his name is Daze. Uh, his real name is, I'm going to butcher it. He, he lives in Rome. It's Italian, even though I'm Italian, I can't pronounce it very well. He, I asked him and he said, yeah, sure. Use it. Oh, and, nice. oh. but is it really his? I mean, I sure it, hope it, so. it was, no, but it, it was on an album. Don't I have to get their permission? So uh, he gave me his permission. Has copyright. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So it's called introspection and I love it, but I love yours more. Oh, okay. Well, I, if I, if I could, I would give you it, but oh, I can't God, even have it's it. It's so good. So. Okay. <laughs> so, um, we were okay, so Hoagland. Yeah, Hoagland, so yes. You were a Art producer. How did you guys hook up? Well, so yeah, so Art Bell left. He started his own show on Sirius XM. He hated the restrictions. He left. Then he created his own network called the Dark Matter Digital Radio Network. Mm -hmm. And he asked Hoagland to create and have his own show to follow his. So Art was on um, for, I think, three hours from 9 to 12, and then Hoagland came on um, from 12 to 2, and his the name of his show was The Other Side of Midnight, and Art's show was called Midnight in the Desert. Then Art left again. Hoagland is still going. So I've always been interested in his theories, specifically about torsion field physics, and the reason why I brought it up is because you asked me what I thought of the number 13, and I think it has to do with resonant frequencies. It has to do with synchronicity, and it has to do with the torsion field. I could be totally off. That's just hmm. the weather report for today. That's just how I feel today about it. And this number that keeps showing up in Jung's life, and um, and like the number 33 keep showing up in my life and how I feel about that. But that's a whole other story. So in, in good ways, bad ways, both. How, it how does, feels you know, right in good ways. It always, so when so it's like a confirmation for you, when you see the 33, you know, you're in the right place. Yeah. And like when I asked you at the top of the show for, for 10 seconds of silence, I think we started at 33 seconds because I was watching. Oh, sorry. I was watching. <laughs> I hit the microphone. I was watching the clock and it was right at 33 that we started and 33 is a number of Freemasonry. It's a big number in Freemasonry, right? It is. It's the highest degree that you can achieve and only the rarest of Freemasons get that. You pretty much have to be, uh, to be big time or had to do something, um, you know, pretty, pretty important to do that. Or you so, have to be extremely knowledgeable of, the degree work to get to that level. Well, who is it that can confer the 33rd degree then? Um, uh, I, 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 I wish I could tell you, but I can't or else that's the old saying and I have to kill you. Okay. Right? Okay. So, so but people um, like, no, and, and, like, and I don't know it, so I, I can't tell you. Okay. And so 30 and 33 degrees, um, only, like I said, it's only, it's, it's, it's pretty rare that, that people do get that. Pretty rare. And, so are, who are, are there any public figures that are 33rd degree Freemasons? Is Tom Hanks one? Um, off the top of my head, I really don't know. Um, I didn't even know Tom Hanks was a Freemason, so he's a Freemason? <laughs> yes, as See, far as I know. I, yeah. I, 
I lived in LA, but I know nothing about celebrity okay. culture. You think oh, for, okay. uh, for I, doing I, the amount of Masonic research. The I've only done, one I, that I, I know for sure is Buzz Aldrin, right? Uh, yes. And he would make, I think he's, I, I think he's a 33rd degree. Yeah. Uh, um, I think he's done something head, pretty important. He, uh, well, a couple things. And, uh, what was the, what was the mission he was on again? Apollo 11. Apollo 11, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 11 is another tetrahedral For a second, I thought it was 13 and I thought I was going to be all cool. And oh. Like, Apollo 13, <laughs> right? But that, no, Tom Hanks played the but yeah there it is <laughs> jim lovell is jim lovell a freemason i don't know i just saw him last year i went to one of his I lectures know. i sat Hanks in the front played, row uh, in for, it was in apollo 13 right yeah so there you go that's our we circled back to 13 13 it always comes back to 13 it t- comes back to 13 so let me and finish the hoagland and 33 let me finish the hoagland story which is that um so Art Bell left his show, Midnight in the Desert. He got somebody to fill in for him. And then he passed away on Friday the 13th last year, April 13th, Friday the 13th. I did not know that. that yeah, is- I went on YouTube. I did a live video. I was devastated. No, I didn't realize it was Friday the 13th. Huh? Yeah. Oh. So uh, Hoagland kept going. He's still going. And I've always been interested in a weird way in his theories which could be totally wrong i mean it could all be bullshit i don't know but they're fascinating and give me an example of one theory that that you're really into from him this 19.5 this angle of 19.5 19.5 degrees longitude on the planet being hot spots and um 19.5 19.5 being used in rituals, many rituals having to do with NASA, with space exploration. Hmm. It's interesting. And so I've, w- I've been in touch with him. I mean, we've had a correspondence for many years. And then um, I just became kind of involved with his show a little bit. And... um helped him book some guests and then his producer had to step away for a while. She got very busy last summer and he asked me to fill in for her. And I did because I had time last summer. I wasn't doing anything uh, during the summer. And so I guest hosted, I actually interviewed him on one episode and I interviewed Ken James, the Jungian analyst, um, because Jung wrote that famous essay on flying saucers. So we did an episode about that. Um, and I, it is a very controversial show. Um, I don't know what to say. So where were we going with Hoagland? Why did that come up? Well, I know you brought it up because you were interested. Uh, you liked his thir- his theories on 13, right? Yeah, he brings up 13, but mostly it's about 19.5. But the reason why I tied it in is because he talks about there being a resonance in the torsion field. And it just reminded me of that. But um, let's move on to what I wanted to talk to you about, uh, aside from your experience with Freemasonry, and it doesn't sound like there's much more you can tell us about that. Oh, just as an aside, I had a wonderful private tour of the huge Scottish Rite uh, temple in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's this big stucco, Spanish stucco, it's pink, It's in the center of town. Uh, Santa Fe is the capital of New Mexico, and it is right near the state capitol building. Have you heard of it? I have not, but if it's like any other... How old is it? I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Uh, It's very old. It's very ornate, and the theater in there is gorgeous. There are all these sets that are built in on slides, for the rituals and the plays mm-hmm. and things. Yeah, theater was where, where all the a lot of the ritual work would be done. Yeah, mm-hmm. and there are cases of costumes. And, and and part of the reason why the temple is probably really nice is because, like we were talking about before, how it used to be a you know a fabric of uh, the way of life for uh, Americans and a um, hundred years ago. Uh, so that means a lot of money was being funneled in at that time. So a lot of those 
places, uh, those temples being built for them are ornate and they're gorgeous. I mean, the, the one in Detroit is, is phenomenal. So is it? Really? yeah, yeah. That one is, is, uh, they, they have concerts there now. Um, but it's, it's absolutely phenomenal, but that's because then it was a fabric of life and, and a lot of money w- was funneled toward mm-hmm. it. And nowadays, uh, you see a lot of those places that were temples, the Masonic lodges for those towns that used to be in those temples, they can't afford being in there anymore. Yeah, I know it was for sale. The one in Santa Fe was for sale for a long time. Yeah, that's extremely common. Yeah, you'll see that a lot. Yeah, there was a rumor that it was going to be turned into a hotel. And then at the last minute, it was saved. And I know that they rent it out for events and things like that. But it is so beautiful. And on the private tour, they talked about all of the symbolism and the as above, so below, and it being connected to the cosmos, like the number of stairs, the number of steps in the stairs to the entryway and the number of windows. And there's a reason for it. And I was wondering if maybe you, I I can't really articulate what I was told. Um, just it being to, to be in balance and in harmony with nature. Is that right? Um, well, a lot of times what we'll do is uh, with the number work with temples, they there's a reason for it. They're, they're talking. It's kind of reflecting some type of ritual um, or some type of, you know, big, deeper meaning with the number, um, whatever it is. Uh, so we temp, you know, as you can imagine, Masons do that purposely. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you go to any temple, uh, particularly one of such stature, that is extremely common. Um, there's always some type of hidden information built into the building. And you recently interviewed a hero of mine, William Mann, who yes, fascinating. Not, not only is a Freemason, but he is a member of the Knights Templar. Is that right? Yes, real, real deal Knights Templar. People think the Knights Templar is something of the past, but no, they're they're still going on, and and, and they're still they're still they're still here. Real deal. Do you know uh, him? Um, so we had a really fascinating interview. Um, I never met him. Okay. I just happened to reach out to him um, about his book because he just came out with a new book right. and he accepted the interview. I think maybe I think I mentioned something that I was a Freemason. So maybe that kind of got me a little foot in the door. Uh, but yeah, we ended up having like a really interesting conversation um, about the Knights Templar treasure because there's this there's this legend that Um, when the night we talked about Friday the 13th, uh, so the Knights Templars had, uh, a lot of them had to flee from this persecution. Uh, so supposedly they took their treasure with them. Why do people think that they had this treasure, right? Uh, because they were originally headquartered in uh, Temple Mount in, in Jerusalem for the first like 20 years of their existence. Then they were in the Vatican. So some people think they have this treasure, um, it could be gold, could be ancient knowledge, could be some type of ancient artifact. Um, so we talked about uh, where is this treasure? And he came out with this book. It's called um, uh, Last Refuge of the Knights Templar. And it's it, essentially it's a fictional book. It's kind of like a Da Vinci Code style book. Uh, but, you know, classic, uh, you know, secret side Knights Templar type people. It's truth within this fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, so the book is actually based on this real these real letters it was a recent discovery between albert pike and another really big famous mason of the 19th century and inside those letters uh so albert pike let me just kind of talk about him mm-hmm. for a second he's a, yeah. he was a confederate he was a confederate general he's clearly a piece of shit um but he's you know confounding in history and, and very controversial <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and he's uh, but side note, as a Freemason, he's probably one of the most knowledgeable Freemasons, uh, Freemasons and really about uh, ancient knowledge, hidden yeah. uh, knowledge that there is. Um, so inside these letters and these correspondences that he's having with this Scottish Rite Freemason, um, he supposedly told where the actual um, treasure is. And supposedly, according to this book mm-hmm. um, and according to him in these letters, the treasure is in somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. And he tried to be, and he was as pretty specific with where it was as specific as, as he could be. Um, so it's pretty interesting um, with William F. Mann in his new book. I mean, I recommend he talks about the, I mean, you can kind of find out where the treasure is and, and just to kind of note what, what the treasure is. I asked him what it is. He wouldn't tell me what it is, but he told me that, the plan is 
uh, for five years, for sometime in the next five years, that the tre- whatever the treasure is, because there are people who, who know where it is and there's companies that have bought the land where supposedly this treasure is, they're Masonic related as well, mm-hmm. um, or Knights Templar related. Um, and supposedly in the next five years, they're going to tell us what the treasure is, what this final Knights Templar treasure is. But it exists, supposedly. Mm-hmm. And it's not buried underneath Oak Island. It's not buried underneath Oak that Island. Show, even that's why that show, that, that supposedly or damn is. show. I mean, <laughs> I'm still watching that thing. Oh, it's what is it, the fifth or sixth season? God damn uh, yeah, those I people. think it might even be up to seven. I, you know, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I've never watched one episode of it, even though I Are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> and this is something I owned up to the guest, uh, Randall <laughs> Sullivan, who's a free, if you watch the I show. Didn't, yeah, I, I listened to that episode. You <laughs> told him you've never watched it. I, I missed that. <laughs> yeah. I must have blocked it out. Yeah, it was like right in the, it was like the first thing I said to him, I said, I'm, I'm going to admit to this, but I've never watched the show. I mean, of course I'm interested in it. So I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm How could you not watch? Because you know, it's not there, right? I just, you know what? I, some of the shows I get into, so, oh, I also didn't have cable for a really long time. So there okay. was that. Okay. Um, and then some of it, you know what? It's it's like any other show. There's there's some truth. And then a lot of that's edited oh, um, into a painful. narrative that they want to put out there that I don't even think a lot of like the Lagina brothers even believe to on some of that. To see the Lagina so. brothers struggle, the look, the, they just look so beaten down oh my god and it's funny that the name money pit right the 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 that's the oh. part of the earthworks that was found there it's the uh the tunnel that's like you know 100 200 feet deep and every 10 feet there's a a wooden platform and mm-hmm. i think that's the most appropriate name for it because for over 200 years people have just been throwing their yeah. money into it and i don't not see how almost anything in it i don't see how you can even set foot on that island anymore it's so unstable the land has been there's a big swamp well, i think only been... like five people live there right something something to that and effect. they keep dying <laughs> and they can't... well yeah i mean well it's dangerous when you're doing that type of work right i mean that was kind of the point of the money pit which is or supposedly the mo- the point of the money pit was to uh to try and keep people out of something that that could be you know a treasure maybe but to make a show around finding a coin a button a piece of wood they're really not getting anywhere. And then to hear William Mann or to see, you know, that in his book, he mentions that it's not even in that general area. No, but no. the thing, so I, I had shared with you a personal story about, and I don't want to get into it here, about how William Mann changed my life. But I, I'll i never forget, you know, what he did for me and uh, you know, I'll always have a place in my heart for him. He, in his work and his research, and but one of the things he told you on the episode that you just recently did with him is that the knowledge is the real treasure, right? Mm-hmm. So people think that it's gold and it's money and it's uh, jewels and it's it's the knowledge and his attitude about it. I really love. Yeah. I mean, to me, it seems so. Let's say, I mean, he's to me, it seems like he really wants this information out there. Um, And the people who know where the treasure is, they know that he knows. Um, So that's why maybe there I don't know if this five year timeline was given to him or that's self imposed. But Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that at some point. Uh, this information, if it is true, William Mann's going to come out with the information if they don't come out with it. If it's on his deathbed, if it's somewhere in his will, okay. he, I think just just talking to him, I have a feeling he wants this information out there. Um, he said it's knowledge. I definitely think it's knowledge, but I also do think it's actually some type of yeah. treasure, gold or money also. Yeah. Yeah. What that knowledge is, I mean, who knows? I mean, what, what, what do you think this knowledge could be? What, what are your thoughts on it? Me? On the, I, well, what are your thoughts on Oak Island and what are your thoughts? Like, do you think that well, what's your theory on oh, Oak Island? See, How about that? Oak Island, it because of where it is geographically located, and for everybody who is not familiar, it is off the coast of Nova Scotia. Right. <laughs> Am I pronouncing Canada. that yep, correctly? Mm-hmm. Nova Scotia, Canada, which is on – so I live in the United States. It's – if you go to the East Coast and you keep going north, right, it's way up there. It's an island, isn't it? Nova right, Scotia. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's off the coast of Nova Scotia. So it's way out east, way up north. And anybody coming from Portugal, where 
there that's one of the theories the knights templar mm -hmm. uh, there's a big church there in portugal i just saw scott walter visit that church with one of the sinclairs and there is a replica of the statue of liberty in front of this church and he found the hooked x i don't know are you familiar with that it's a, it's a it's a symbol that is that is um, related to, I believe, is it uh, Roshan Cruz uh, Roshan or Knights Templar? I, I think Knights Templar. Knights Templar. Yeah, I think yeah. it was on their shield. Maybe is what it was. It's just th there are so few clues in this whole puzzle, and the shows are created, and they keep repeating the same things, and so I, d I just feel like we're really not getting anywhere. Um, but and it's almost kind of like a Rorschach test. So, so like whatever your bias is, um, you can use whatever evidence that they found there for it or some, some of it and disregard the rest. I mean, but they've found some pretty interesting stuff. I mean, they found crosses that had to be of man-made. They found, uh, you know, a large cross over like a hundred yards that was built from stone. So, I mean, there's some pretty interesting finds there. And I think that on Oak Island, they didn't, they find like a hundred feet deep, uh, bones, uh, and supposedly the bones, whether this is real or not, if it was contaminated or not, who knows. Right. But supposedly the ancestry of those bones are one is European and one is Middle Eastern. Um, so let's say you wanted to say the Knights Templar treasure is there or some type of treasure like that is there, um, secret society, Freemason, Freemason related. I mean, you could probably find reason for it. They say that for all the earthworks that were done there to make that money pit 200 feet deep with those platforms, um, to have the, the built a flood system in, in there as well, it would have had to take hundreds of thousands of man of hours of manpower. Um, you will. So that means you would have had to need access to a lot of men that knew how to do earthworks that knew how to do stonework who also could keep a secret, right? Cause we don't yeah. know anything about what this really is. They found crosses if the bones of the de the ancestry of those bones are real, I mean, a lot of that you could say adds up to Knights Templar, right? Okay, so even if the Knights Templar were at Oak Island, which I don't think it is, but I'm saying you, you my don't point think is, is that you could. I don't because of what William F. Mann said. I'm going to take it from a real deal. Knights Templar, if okay. he, maybe one of their treasures is there because they fled into different areas. Right. Um, but what I was going to say, I'm sorry to jump in here, no, but please. what what I was going to say is that I think they went through there. So what I was getting at was that if you leave Portugal to head toward North America, you're going to hit that area first. You could, right? You're going to hit that area first. So you're going to hang out there for a while and be on your way. So I don't, think that they stopped at Oak Island and they buried their treasure there. Or maybe they did something. Those wooden planks, though, <laughs> right? Well, there, maybe that's why it's, it's <laughs> I was so hooked. But uh, supposedly, so there's this new book that came out on Oak Island. I think it came out last year. I probably should throw an invitation out there just so I can get the other side of it. Yeah. Uh, they proposed that there was evidence that there was some type of early manufacturing company in the uh, 17th century, which would predate the near the time of when those discoveries were. So if there was an early manufacturing company mm -hmm. there, maybe they could have dug that somehow. Who knows? I think I don't know if that's true, but I think it's an interesting mundane theory. And that could be a myth too. Those planks. And that and could be, that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know exactly because that's the whole problem is that you know, because the further you you dig down, there the there. So like we said before, there was this flood system. So you dig down, mm -hmm. you would trigger something, it would flood mm -hmm. the whole place. You keep digging down, and by now, what they call the money pit mm -hmm. is actually not where the original uh, location. It's nearby, but it's not the original one. So. It's it's tough, you know. Um, it's what where they're digging. It's wait. So, what do you think about Oak Island? What do I think? I think, I think that I don't know. I really don't know. I think, like I said, you could have a Rorschach. So, I mean, I think those things I said before the about the manpower. I mean, all those things could add up to Knights Templar if you wanted. Um, I try to always keep the keep it simple, stupid one. You know, mm -hmm. per theory or our perspective where. What's the simple answer? The Occam's razor, and okay. so manuf early manufacturing companies make sense, but that's way too boring and snooze fest for me. So I'm gonna. How about I throw out one that's a little bit more fun? 
uh, and maybe something to think about as well. Um, what if, you know, everybody says that this, this, this money pit was made to, to hide something, to hide a treasure and then eventually be able to access. What if it wasn't, uh, what if it wasn't hiding something, but it was holding something in that you don't want out? Maybe a, a weapon or, uh, or, or, or something but, nefarious. But they've, they've scoured this place. And one of the things that in your I know, it, that's just my fun theory. I'm just throwing it out there, seeing what sticks. No, I like that. I like that. And I, I'm thinking about your interview with Randall Sullivan, who is a journalist, right? And he went to Oak Island to sort of investigate the investigators Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was originally uh, hired by Rolling Stones uh, to write an article about Oak Island because I think there was some documentary that came out in the mid 90s uh, prompted people to start, you know, a little bit more uh, popular uh, about Oak Island. And that prompted him to to write an article about it. And that kind of kept him on this research for the next, you know, 20 plus years or so. For and, he, and he was on one of the episodes. Yeah, I and, think he's been on a couple of them. Yeah. And for everybody listening, if you're not familiar, the name of the show is The Curse of Oak Island, and it mm -hmm. airs on the History Channel. And I have an episode of a similar name. So if you want to hear it, um, definitely, you know, I have all my archives up there for free. I will put a link to that. I'm going to write Thanks. it down. Um, sure. I will put a link to that in the show notes on speakingofyoung.com. So right. what Randall Sullivan told you is he said that his military buddies said they could solve this in one day if they were allowed access to that island. Because every episode of this show, they have some boring company, some drilling company, <laughs> some right, excavator right. there yep. digging a diver. They had so many episodes with divers going down into the water to see what they can find. And nobody finds anything but a piece of wood or a, a, a stone in the shape of a triangle. Come on. What they should be looking for, and I don't know, I haven't watched the recent episodes, they should be looking for some type of uh, another entry. If, if this really is hiding something, a treasure or did at mm -hmm. some point, there has to be another access point. Uh, so and so if it, if this was built over 200 years ago because of beach erosion, uh, it, the access point would probably be somewhere offshore, 30, 40, 50 feet, something like that. So if they really wanted to to solve it, they, this is what they should be looking for. Are they not? Hopefully solving? they are. I have no clue. I don't watch the show. But if they really wanted to, that's something that they should be looking into. Right. And, and I don't mean to belabor the point. I'm sorry. It's just that I, no, I've been please. watching this damn show for years and I'm just waiting for a conclusion. But William Mann saying that the Templar treasure is not actually buried uh, under Oak, in Oak Island, right. under Oak Island. And, you know, Rob Sullivan told me that too. I had asked him years ago. He said, it's not there. And I thought he's a Freemason. He knows. But I'm still watching this damn show. Um, I got to <laughs> stop. Still interesting. They still have great finds. It's still, I mean, it's still fascinating. No, no, because they brought somebody in with this really high pitched voice and he's ruined the whole show. He walks around with one of those metal detectors. I, I don't even know his name. But anyway, so, uh, William Mann saying you have to have the eyes to see the signs, seals, and tokens that I don't have the eyes to see. I don't know what I'm looking for. Um, but I feel like you guys know. I interview the people that know the know. Uh, I, um, but then you know. I know a little bit, maybe more than than the average, but 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 barely anything. So, and really, they would know. You know, the listeners could know if you if you read the stuff that I read. I'm not getting anything uh, extra okay. if you listen to my episodes. Uh, you'll hear all the information that I find out. Okay. It's not like I'm, I, I, you know, I'm not having a conversation 45 minutes after the interview is done with William Mann, and he's saying, no, this is the exact location of, you know, I don't, I don't know that much more, but okay. what I know, the listeners know. Okay. <laughs> all right. So who are some of the other interesting guests you've had? I, I mentioned some during the intro. Um, in addition to that, you've had the niece of Zechariah Sechen. Zechariah uh -huh. Sitchin, Janet Sitchin. Sitchin on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... It's pretty interesting. Oh, I'm not. A, and that was a while ago. Um, I think uh, we did an episode on Asian aliens and uh, she just talked about her experiences with, um, you know, living with him or, you know, being related to him. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you. So who were some of your favorite guests? Well, outside of um, 
Laura London, <laughs> one of my all-time favorites. Uh, oh, God. Uh, whew, that's, that's a good question. Uh, it's kind of funny, uh, and this is probably a crappy analogy, but it's kind of like I'm a parent, right? I have all these little babies, yeah, and, and you don't have a favorite. But let's be serious. Every parent really has a favorite, so I'll tell you a couple. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I, I, a couple months ago, I interviewed... DEA agent Steve Murphy and Javier Pena, uh, they were the the agents who helped take down Pablo Escobar. Mm-hmm. The same agents who are depicted uh, that the first two seasons of Netflix uh, Narcos uh, season is uh, excuse me series is based off of. Um, I spoke with National Ranger uh, Andrea Langford about some haunting haunting and ghost stories in national parks. Uh, the one that you didn't want to listen to because you were scared. The I spoke to journalist <laughs> Tom O'Neill about the Manson murders, and he uh, yeah. gave us uh, some couple a uh, couple interesting connections that talks about the CIA and FBI's involvement in okay. it. Uh, so yeah, I really and, and and they range from all over the place. So I, I love music episodes. So I recently did an episode uh, with music journalist Chris Welch. He had. Uh, a few dec he had some decades spanning interviews with Eric Clapton. So it was Eric Clapton's seventy fifth birthday and I want to do a little celebration of him. Yeah. Uh so that yeah, so we, we do a little bit of everything and I love music episodes. I love true crime episodes, as disturbing as they are, they're always interesting. What do you mean by music episodes? What is that? Um so I've done episodes about Eric Clapton, Bob Dylan. You mean Otis, about their biography? About, their, about their yeah, lives? about it's essentially it's a biographical episode that is premised or what prompted it would be an anniversary. So, for example, it was the 75th birthday uh, for Eric Clapton a couple of months ago. Uh, for Bob Dylan a few years ago, it was his 75th birthday. Mm-hmm. Um, Sublime, it was the 25th anniversary of the release of 40 Ounces to Freedom. So some type of anniversary will prompt it, and I'll do some type of biographical work um, and hopefully get as close to the source as possible. So if you're a big ska, reggae, um, punk fan and you like Sublime, I did two interviews, one with Todd Zulkins, who was best friends with uh, Bradley Knoll, the lead singer of Sublime and, and the band. So um, so it's just a biographical episode. and I try to get as close as possible. And I love music and I love to talk about music. And it seems to be a pretty big hit with listeners. They always mm-hmm. seem to be highly rated. Mm-hmm. And you've also interviewed. What, what do you like? What are, What are your favorite episodes? Well, oh, you interviewed one of my, uh, another one of my friends, Robert Bouval, who uh, isn't really around anymore. He's kind of, um, retired now. And was that a few years ago you interviewed? Yeah, that that was a few years ago. I think it was around the time of the, of contact in the desert. Uh, and he is, I mean, yeah, that was a really interesting one. We I haven't also, talked about the, you and I meeting at contact. I know. But anyway, okay. So me and being too cool for me. <laughs> uh, and what's cool about Rob So Boval, not true. And Wait. a lot of people talk shit about Rob Boval. I think he's an absolutely oh, wonderful him. human being. Yeah. Um, you know, despite whatever his perspective is, if you disagree with his, his stuff, he's an absolutely wonderful human being. And he actually hooked me up with, he hooked me up with an interview. He's like, you should interview this guy, Dominic Gorlitz. Uh, who was, oh, yes. uh, you know, an independent archaeologist researcher. And he ended up, you know, in a kind of in a tricky way, ended up uh, doing an investigation inside the Great yeah. Pyramid and found some pretty interesting stuff. So yeah. I'm a big fan of Robert Boval, um, just as a human being. Mm. I don't necessarily agree with all of his uh, his theories, oh, really? uh, but I'm a big fan. Yeah, some of it I do. I think some of it definitely seems uh, makes sense, but not everything. Really? Huh. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, uh, it, was he an ancient alien believer? I mean, I know like no. he talked about what the alignment of the Great Pyramids. No, he was said, not an ancient stuff. alien oh, okay, believer at all. In I thought, fact, for some he, reason I thought he was. He appeared on an early episode and then he said he didn't want to have anything to do with those people. Oh, maybe anymore. that's why I thought it was. Okay, yeah. So, but yeah, no, he's an interesting person. He has a really different perspective about uh, Egypt. And I would totally recommend people listening to that episode. Mm-hmm. And uh, Robert Schock. Robert True Schrock, yeah. of the Sphinx. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, he, I'm a big fan of Robert Schrock. Uh, he was, I think he originally came onto the scene in the 90s. He did a documentary about the Sphinx. And from his, uh, he's a geologist, and he believes that he sees evidence that uh, the Sphinx had, uh, you know, parts of it was underwater at some point. 
Uh, and then he recently came out with a book about Gobekli Tepe, or I guess at this point it's probably four years ago. And Gobekli Tepe is a really interesting archaeological area, uh, and it seems to date back to uh, 12,000, 13,000 years or so, something like that. And it might be evidence uh, of a advanced civilization much earlier than what we thought. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So wait a minute. So Beauval. Let's go back to Beauval. Yes. Let's trail back to Beauval. So he is one of my favorite people. And I hope he's okay. I know he became ill and he kind of retired and went into seclusion. So I, nobody that I know who knows him has been in contact with him. And I just hope he's okay. Um, I think he's a treasure. And you and I were both at the same contact in the desert. This was in 2016. And this is yes. when Buval and I met in person. We had only ever Skyped. He lives in Spain. I think he lives in Andalusia. And he would Skype me with his shirt off. Hilarious. I believe that. I, there's a couple pictures of him on Google when I was trying to get a pro, you know a picture for him from the website where he's shirtless. So yeah, that seems to make sense. And yeah, he, he would po uh, post self selfies in his speedo does he have large areolas or not i, I would i can't take remember the, plead the fifth on okay. that okay okay yeah. so Beval, we've kind of veered off into some interesting directions <laughs> i apologize for that one please don't apologize that's what the uh quarantine episodes are <laughs> yes. for is that uh we get to do that here q3 so, yes exactly q3 <laughs> Um, so wait a minute, you and I were at the same yes. talk. I didn't see you at his talk because so the contact in the desert for those people who do, have no idea what we're talking about is held every year. And unfortunately, they moved the, the location, which to me ruins the whole thing. The whole, yes. yeah, the whole uh, kind of uh, what do I want to say? I don't know the, if it normally the, ruins the whole thing for me, but it, you know, there's nothing like Joshua Tree. There's right? nothing no, like Joshua nothing Tree like. Retreat Center, which is way out there. Um, so I flew into LAX, and then I actually rode in a car with um, the host of I forgot the name of the show. I'm sorry, he's going to kill me. Um, two show hosts. The the their names are escaping me at the moment. You can always add it in afterwards. Uh, and we ro drove, they drove, because I don't drive, they drove up into the desert, into, is it called 12 Palms, California? And it's gorgeous. The Joshua Tree Retreat Center is way out there. It's very rustic. Um, and the Dalai Lama, you know, gave talks there and a bunch of really high level spiritual teachers have taught there. And the vibe there, I still have flashbacks to Joshua Tree. I've been there twice. I was there in 2009. And then at the conference you and I were both at in 2016. But it was very hot that year. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the understatement of, uh, of that year, actually. And I was not, when I got there, I was not well. I stayed in my hotel room for like the first day and a half. And there were people mad at me <laughs> because I was supposed to like meet Barbara Honiger for dinner. And I was camping in a tent. So could you imagine that? Five o'clock in the morning, I was sweating. <laughs> I mean, it was great, but uh, yeah, no, I was sweating. <laughs> it was so hot that people were passing out. And did you hear that? Like Mike Barra passed out and people really? were huh. being taken. I don't even know if they were taken to the hospital, but it was so goddamn hot. And I was staying in a hotel. Oh, this is where we left off is we had made our, um, myself and Beyond the Strange. That's the name of the podcast. That's the guy that I rode with um, from the airport, uh, Dave Cruz and Len. And yes, I'm, I'm actually subscribed to them. Okay. Len, I'm not sure if Len is still around. Um, anyway, so we stayed in this hotel that was far from the retreat center. See, the first time I went to the Joshua Tree Retreat Center, I stayed in one of those bungalows on site. And it was at the Dreamland Festival, Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Festival with William Henry and Starfire Tour, who I'm going to be having on the show in a couple of weeks. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So, uh, 
the hotel was this long drive from the retreat center. And so anyway, it was so hot. I was not well. And I stayed in my room a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, where was I going with this? Bouval. So what I'm getting to is that Robert Bouval's talk was it, so none of it's air conditioned at the retreat center. Right, right. Right. And well, you were staying in a tent, so obviously you had no air conditioning. <laughs> and I was hiding out at the hotel where I could stay cool and, you know, be just rest in the dark and it was awful. So, but I was already ill before I got there. I was having an issue. Um, and so the heat just made it worse. So, I didn't know you were there until I was looking on Facebook and I saw you had posted photos of Bouval in that room giving that lecture, which is unmistakable. I mean, the, <laughs> nothing yeah. else looks like it, right? Correct, right. So I was so hot in that room. I mean, picture it was this. Blazing. It, it was blazing. Was, it was over 100 degrees outside. And I remember posting on Facebook a screen cap of, you know how people do this, that you open the app on your iPhone, the weather app, and it shows the degrees. It was 100 degrees, but it felt like it was 200 degrees. And I only wore black, so <laughs> I'm dressed in black head to toe. And I walked into Baval's talk and this woman at the door said to me, go put a wet towel on your head. Now, I was worried about my hair, okay? <laughs> So I wasn't going to put a wet towel on my head. And I told her to F off. And I got whatever seat I could. And he gave this tremendous talk, didn't he? Oh, it was, it was fascinating. I mean, I, everybody was hanging on every yeah. single word. Yeah. And it was so intense. Whether you agree or disagree with any of his stuff, you can't deny or argue. However he puts it out, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> he he presents things in such a fascinating interest. He's so engaging. Yes, and he lived next to the Great Pyramid, one of the uh, yes. th these apartment complexes, right, where you can see the pyramid from your balcony. And mm -hmm. he had sent me all these photos. Um, so my father – Were they topless also? No, no. <laughs> uh, they were not. Um, but my father had given my mother I, – I have this fascination with ancient Egypt. He, my father gave my mother a solid gold brooch of the Sphinx. And as far as I know, there was no connection to ancient Egypt. It was not discussed in our house, you know, when I was growing up. So I was shocked to see this brooch. Um, when I was an adult, you know, my mom showed me that my dad had given her this brooch. And so she gave it to me since I liked it. And one of the reasons why Robert Bouval and I were Skyping and was because I wanted to show him this brooch and ask him because I'm just wanting to understand why that and then this snake ring that I talked about uh, on, I think I talked about it on episode one with Daryl Sharp. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to know what this scene was on this brooch. And so he explained some of the symbolism to me. Um, but where was I going with this? Uh, I can't remember now. Help me, Brian. I don't Just know. his, oh, he, <laughs> he, <laughs> he uh, his connection to ancient Egypt and his correlating the three belt stars of Orion with the, mm -hmm. the layout of the three pyramids on the Giza Plateau. Um just means a lot to me, and I don't know why. I, I've always been fascinated by Israel, too. I mean, I remember as a kid uh, reading books about the pyramids and, and just kind of being confounded by that. I mean, to me, to me, a lot, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, <sighs> I don't know. Maybe I just want to believe more, but it, to me, I don't. I don't necessarily say that everything that we've been taught about Egypt and Egyptologists, especially uh, what's his name, Zawa, uh, what's his name, Zawa? Zahi Hawass. Yeah, I mean, to, a lot of things he said. I mean, it seems like he was just in it for some of the profit, and then I mean, he was ousted himself. So right. him as a as a source isn't reliable because he was ousted by his own people, right? And you can you know argue about the reasons why he was ousted, but he was ousted. 
and it wasn't allowed back. Uh, so they're definitely hiding something. In- and you know, him and Robert Robert Boval. I mean, they they were like mortal enemies, pretty yeah. much, right? <laughs> or at yeah. least from Boval's um, right you know, perspective. So, um, but uh, you know, for me personally, I always found it confounding. And um, I don't know if we necessarily ha- really is it King Joffrey who's responsible for it. I don't know. I think I think the 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 answer still remains. Still remains uh, to be seen. It's, it's an open. Open uh, question there. Um, so also, somebody else you interviewed that I knew is Rick Strassman, who wrote the book on DMT, The yes. Spirit Molecule. Yes. And the reason why I met him is because, wait, wait a minute, let's back up. So yeah, you and I met at Contact in the Desert before we yes. get to Strassman. So, yes, I think that's what started this. Right. Yes. So we, because you and I chatted beforehand, I got confused as to what we talked about on air. So we met at George Norrie's birthday party, which mm-hmm. Jimmy Church, I was just on his show a few weeks ago, and he told me that they have it every every year at Contact in the Desert. They do George's party. Uh, I didn't from know what that. it sounds like, yeah. Uh, from what it's, and and for listeners, if you haven't been there, and this is kind of like a, what a, what Coast Coast does when they go for these live shows, he'll go out with a band and, and actually sing. Yeah. Uh, and I think this one was more of a special one because it was his birthday. And you and didn't you weren't you part of a birthday dinner with him also? Well, no. I mean it. Or, you or, were wait. You were there for the music portion, right? I was there for the music portion, uh, and I think there was also a special dinner which you could go to. Uh, yes. if, you know, some if you had the right type of ticket or whatever. <laughs> right. So before the music was it just, it was a buffet dinner at Contact in the Desert in another hot tent, and there <laughs> I was dressed in black, head to toe, and we all had dinner together and it was there's this photo that i love of the main table where stanton friedman the late great stanton friedman was sitting and in that photo at that table are dr friedman travis walton Giorgio sukalos his wife jimmy church and there's some people out of the shot and then you can see me in the back of the room <laughs> I'm wearing sunglasses. I have no idea why in the back of the room, but uh, it was it was a good time. And then so you and I finally met because I was on your show that same year. I was on your show in February and then contact was in June. Right, right. And and then you ignored me for all of contact in the desert, if I, I recall did? correctly. I'm <laughs> no. so sorry. No, we, we both had different agendas, obviously. I... Um although we, 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 we were lucky that we did have a a moment of meeting, but we because of the nature of our podcast or the nature of what we were both trying to uh, achieve there, we were both like like two passing ships in the night. <laughs> I was going somewhere else, you were going somewhere and, and so it went forth, but I was lucky to you know, I, I feel blessed to, to, to actually have be able to meet you in the real. I was so happy to meet you. That was that was a great moment. And um at George Norrie's birthday party, I mean Of all places. It, it doesn't you know? get better than that. George is great. We love George. And I think those were my shaved head dates. So uh right yeah. now I have actually grown a little my hair back. So you for have about hair. twenty yeah, for about twenty years or so, my twenties and my thirties, uh most of the time I've had a shaved head, but I decided to grow my hair back for a little bit. So mm-hmm. I think uh, you may not even re- if you pass me on the street right now, you may not even re- think it's I the same. I wouldn't recognize person. you. Yeah, you oh. wouldn't even know. That's almost four years ago now. Yeah, it's it's a, it's it's amazing how how time goes by quickly. You know, yeah. I just moved to L.A. at that time. I was there for a month or so, and I've already moved away from that from L.A. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, time time goes by quickly. Uh, a lot's amazing. happened, but um, you got to meet George, and I got yeah, to for say a brief hi moment. to George. Yeah, yeah, brief moment. George Nori, George Knapp, those are definitely two of my. Uh, Two of my radio host talk announcer uh, talk announcers idols for Your sure. Your idols, yeah. And was yeah, Nap definitely. there that night? Nap wasn't there, okay. no. Um, but I just I just really respect what he does, and yeah. um, I think if people start listening, you know, if your listeners who haven't listened and they they start listening to my show, I mean, you'll probably see that I'm a bit of a I want to say I'm a complete coast to coast ripoff, um, but I definitely emulate in some way. And if I could be any host there, although all of them are amazing, I mean, I would love to be George Nap. If one day someone said, "Hey, you're," You're 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 a diet George Knapp. That would be the biggest compliment to me. Uh, 
I, I, I love that. I love having people who are our inspirations and our idols, people to look up to and that we love. They, uh, they keep me going and sounds like, uh, the same is true for you. So mm-hmm. and I, I pretty much that. lived in the, and I lived in the shadow of actually where coast to coast, uh, the actual radio station is, um, mm-hmm. in, um, yep. Sherman Oaks, California. Yeah. So when I was living in LA, I just so happened to live about three blocks away from it. And every day I'd, I'd pass it on my way to work and say, you know what? Maybe Someday. one day, yeah. one day. Someday. I love it. I love it. So, um, then we went to Rick, Rick Strassman. So, yes. um, you talked to him about, I think he has a new book on DMT and the soul of prophecy, a new science of spiritual revelation in the Hebrew Bible. And Dr. Strassman is a professor in New Mexico, and I met him at a book signing in Santa Fe when his seminal book on DMT, The Spirit Molecule, came out. And that book has been referenced so much. Um, I've never done DMT, have you? I have not, although I've been in the presence of someone who has. Oh, yes. you have. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I think it's pretty quick from, from, if I recall correctly, it doesn't really last that long. Uh-huh. Um, but from it seems like uh, when you're going through it, from how it's described, almost of a religious spiritual yeah. uh, um, effect. Yeah. Uh, so that's why he came and... out with that book, which connects okay. why people believe that there might be, I think it's a, you know, a spiritual world and the connection between that and DMT. And DMT is a natural, I believe, a hormone that is actually produced naturally in the body. Dimethyltryptamine. So, yes, thank you. I wasn't even going to try and pronounce mm-hmm. it, so I'm glad that uh, you could. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so it's something that we produce naturally in it. And he was trying to make connections. Maybe that could be a reason why there's this idea of, you know, that we think that there's some type of spiritual existence or plane or, or there's something else out there. What do you think? Uh, When it comes to DMT or when it comes to... No, when it comes to... Because in my intro for you, did you catch what I said about your your initial uh, kind of what, where this all came from? Yeah, my foray into it. Yeah, your foray into it is your fear of death and wanting to know if there is proof of life after life. Yeah, uh, so for some reason, I've always had this death anxiety. Yeah, me too. I thought of it. Yeah, Honestly, so you know what it's me like. Too. I mean, yeah. Uh, so you know, sometimes once you, if you, you can compulsively think about death and you do that, uh, for me, particularly, um, if there isn't no light, that what freaks me out is the, the idea that there's blackness, right? After death, that there, that we don't Black exist. Velvet. That, yeah, there's nothing, right? I love life. I love sensing. I love feeling. I love my friends. I love my family. Mm-hmm. And the fact that if there is nothing after this, it is depressing as hell. Yeah. And it used to cause a lot of depression and anxiety for me. It still does. I just had a, a panic attack about it, you know, a month ago. And now they're rare and few and far between. But that's okay. what prompted me into, uh, you know, looking into the paranormal, particularly into the afterlife, because I, it kept causing this anxiety and I just couldn't get away from these con- compulsive thoughts about death and blackness. Um, so that's what prompted me into becoming, uh, or, you know, uh, for a while there doing a lot of paranormal research and investigation. Um, you know, I probably did, uh, thousands of hours in a six year span. I probably did a thousand, thousands of thousands of hours of investigation, uh, hundreds of locations. And, you know, in that time, Maybe I can say 20 to 30 minutes of that total is unexplainable. Okay. But uh, those 20 and 30 minutes, uh, I, you know, that they stay with me and, and it has helped me. Mm. It, 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 it showed me that there might be something afterwards, um, something after life, that consciousness does exist afterwards. And it's helped me, um, you know, progress through anxiety issues. Um, I mean, I could talk about it if you want. What I, that I would love for was, you to but, tell uh, us about that. But yeah. yeah, so that's what that's what prompted me into it. So um, I did a solo investigation. It was uh, 2014, so a little while ago now at this point. I did a, an investigation at the Houghton Mansion. Uh, that's based in North Adams, Massachusetts. It's on the border of Vermont. Uh, it's been featured on a couple of those, you know, paranormal shows, which right. I'm sure people watch. Uh, so I'll kind of set the scene here a little bit for you. Tell you, you know, because when it comes to paranormal stuff 
uh, ghosts, the history is really important. So if you can okay. match some type of explainable um, phenomena with the history, you know, ding, 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 you found something that you can maybe say is substantive as evidence for okay. You know, paranormal. Uh, so I went to Houghton Mansion. It's named after A.C. Houghton. He was a Freemason himself. Uh, he was the first mayor of North Adams. Uh, on August 1st, 1914, him, his daughter, uh, a couple of friends, and then his butler, longtime butler, Mr. Witters, they went out for a little joyride. I mean, this is 1914, so at the time, I mean, there's really nothing as I mean, there's a joyride, but every joyride is dangerous just okay. because of the infancy of paved roads at the time and oh. cars only existed for 30 years at that point not even um so they went on a little joy ride they were on this road it was being blocked by this uh, stable of uh, uh, by this team of horses they tried passing on the left uh but unfortunately something happened uh to their car and it went it essentially propped down this deep embankment uh the car was rolling over and over uh Mary, the daughter of A.C. Houghton, she was stuck inside the car. So she was rolling over and over inside this car. She died later on. Oh. Um, everybody else was hurled from the car. One person, Mrs. Huddington, the friend, she died pretty much instantaneously. Mary died later in the hospital. There was three men in it that actually only came away with um, scratches. Um, but this event kind of prompted this unbelievable chain of deaths pretty much. So Mary died that night. Mrs. Huddington died during the event. Later on that night, Mr. Witters, who I told you before was the butler, he was driving the car. He was really – he was there for like 30-plus years with the family, so he was really more of like an uncle. He felt extremely guilty. He went into the barn around you know, sometime after 1.30 or so, really early in the morning, late night, uh, and killed himself. Ten days later um, – who is it? Ten days later, uh, Mr. Hoden, A.C. Hoden, who the mansion is named after – he died from actual internal hemorrhaging, which they didn't realize that he had. Um, and a few days after Mr. Hoden or sometime shortly after Mr. Hoden, Mrs. Mr. Huddington, the father of the female neighbor who died instantaneously, he committed suicide. Ten, then two years later, Mrs. Hoden, wife of A.C., mother of Mary, she passed away in the same bedroom as, as A.C. Jesus. Hoden. So, yeah, so this tragic event, August 1st, 1914, it set off this chain of events which people believe have influenced these hauntings. Um, so I actually was able to do, as a Mason, I was uh, kind of got me that, that, that good old foot in the door, and uh, luckily I was able to do an investigation. So in 1926, the remaining daughter of A.C. Hoden, he, they pretty much just gave the, you know, they pretty much just gifted the, mansion to the masons okay. oh, um, a couple okay. of years ago they actually couldn't afford now we're touching on coming back to something that we said before they couldn't right. even afford to live there so they ended up selling it so i'm really thankful to have this experience mm -hmm. um but since that time when the masons took it over pretty much this has run the whole ghost paranormal gamut uh voices shadows sensation of touching everything that you can think of when it comes to ghosts um so I was doing an investigation there. I was in the lodge room. It was built a year after the Masons took over. It's the only okay. um, addition to the home. Everything else still retains pretty much the originality of it mm -hmm. for the most part outside of, you know, construction and updates. Uh, so I was doing an EVP session. Essentially, you're just asking questions to hopefully you get answers in response. I was doing it um, through this thing called the ghost box. And it, what that does, it's a tool. It scans the FM and AM frequencies and produces white noise. And, and supposedly, uh, ghost spirits can use this white noise to produce words. Um, so I was wait, asking wait, wait, to produce words, to produce words, um, okay. from their side. So if, if I ask a question, right. um, they can answer through that white noise. Okay. So I was doing an EVP session, electronic voice phenomena. Uh, and so I was recording it. And I was asking these questions. When you're asking these questions, you try to get as personal as possible. Um, so I was just asking, or you also go generic. So I was asking these questions. I was in the lodge. It was probably around 1.30 in the morning or so. And I asked, do you have a, you know, I was doing the, the session, getting nothing. And then I asked, do you have a message for somebody? And the answer I hear, everyone, because how it sounds, it sounds like kind of like a digital voice. So, right. uh, so it said, so I get the word everyone. And it was pretty clear as day. There's this, um, there's different types of EVPs, A, B, C, and A is the clearest, C is like, you know, barely discernible. And this is what I consider an A EVP. You can hear it pretty clearly. I repeat, who do you want? So I ask, who do you want to give the message to? They say the same answer, everyone. 
I, I then ask, who do you want to give the message to? Clear as day, I get the word Douglas. I don't know who the hell Douglas is okay. in my research. Yeah, in my research, yeah. everything I just talked about, there's no Douglas at all. So it turns out I was doing the solo investigation, but one of the brothers with this, with me. It turns out the name Douglas, I was the one who said Douglas. I'm like, did they just say Douglas? And he said, huh, that's interesting. Douglas is our current worshipful master. Oh. His father was a Mason. He died at a young age, and I'm pretty sure with the mansion, there was a Mason who actually died, had a heart attack. I'm almost positive that's who it was. Oh. So I'm getting these responses clear as day. This never happens. Uh, and in, I'm getting this message. They have a message for everybody, uh, and it's for this person, Douglas, who happens to be the worshipful master. I had no clue about that. So it was weird how this happened is one of my few experiences and it seemed to me like this convergence of all these different things. So I was there. I happened to be there on August 1st, 2014, 100 years to the day Ooh. of the chain of events. Um, I'm a Freemason, so I have that connection right mm -hmm. there. And you know what else August 1st is? August 1st is my birthday. Uh, oh, so, you know, the idea is that, that, you know, we could, that sometimes on certain times, events or days or whatever, the veil is thinner between mm. the living and the dead. Mm. Uh, and to me, I barely have had any experiences. This was the one experience that I always look back on and oh. it seems to be a convergence of all these things. And that's the only reason why I think it happened Okay, because of the dates, the anniversaries, okay. me being a Mason and my birthday. Okay. Otherwise it wouldn't have happened. Um, so it's, it was this pretty amazing experience. One of the few that I have had in thousands of hours of doing it, uh, that I look back, look back on and it makes mm -hmm. me think, you know, um, it gives me less anxiety about death. Less anxiety about death. And you know what I actually did? And, you know, I think a lot of people, you, you, you come on, you talk about ghosts and you, you know, they don't really have the proof is in the pudding. So what I did, I actually, I figured we might talk about this. I posted on my website and I also posted on social media okay. and they can listen to some of these clips and, you oh, know, great. But, yeah. So, you know, if you hear what I'm hearing, great. If you say I'm just, it's crock of shit and I don't know what I'm talking about. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> you know, go to my website. It's the minds com. Uh, my Facebook and Twitter pages are at Minds Eye Show. I posted it there. You can listen, and I'd love to to hear what, what what your thoughts are, your thoughts, and then the listeners' thoughts too. So I'd love to after you listen to it, let me know. Okay, and I will put links those links on. I'll, the... I can send you the videos too if you want, and then you can have it on your website. Yes, too. that would be great. I'll put links to yeah, all of that on the episode page. Yeah, this is you episode said before. I like my role was the skeptical believer, right? Yep. Um, so I really, I think these things happen. I think they're extremely rare and I don't believe anything unless I have some type of proof. So proof. if I'm going to make these claims, I got to have some type of proof, right? Proof. Yeah. And I will something to back it up. Yeah. Yeah. And so people I'm sure will be interested in seeing and hearing that for themselves. And there will be links to those items that you just mentioned on the episode page, episode Q3 at speakingofyoung.com and also on Brian's website, themindseyemedia.com. So are there any other experiences that you would like to share with us as far as the spirit world or that dimension? Um, so I was a pretty big, like I said before, I was a pretty big investigator for about six years or so, yeah. really intense, hundred investigations. But I've kind of walked away from that. Probably actually even this event kind of probably prompted that a little bit. I feel like I don't need to investigate as much because now I, I have something to, to have kind it, of look at, right? right? Um, but I'm always still doing research. I love history. Um, I love ghost stories. I love looking at haunted places and uh, I have this really long gestating book that actually talks about ghosts and, um, and, you know, based on the pace that I'm doing it, it probably won't come out to like 2090 or something like that. But, uh, a book that you're uh, writing that a book that I'm writing. Yeah. Great. It's about 50 pages deep right now. And it okay. it's actually has to do with ghost stories. Um, so if you want, I, I would be more than happy to share one of those, uh, stories that yeah. I think actually have some type of, uh, substantive history behind it. Okay. Um, uh, so George Washington, uh, his ghost is his That's ghost so is, weird. I was just thinking why? about him earlier. Okay. Why why were you thinking about him? I want to well, know. We were you were talking about presidents and Freemasonry. Mm, right. And I mm -hmm. thought George Washington was a Freemason. I wonder if he's gonna bring that up. 
Yeah, so he has a lot of ghost story here. You can hear my dog jumping on my lap right there, probably. Oh, I missed um, it. <laughs> uh, so go, the ghost of George Washington, it is, uh, it's seen everywhere, and it's seen throughout you know different time periods. What? Seen at his home uh, pretty quickly after his death. It's uh, his ghost has been seen. Uh, it was really big during the Civil War. The Union soldiers claim seeing him at uh, Battle of Gettysburg. Um, claiming to see, help them point in the right direction, helping rally the troops, um, talking to General Chamberlain uh, and General Joshua Chamberlain. Uh, he didn't even deny this. Uh, he, you know, he was more of an, uh, he didn't deny it because it was a really big rallying point that we saw George Washington and helped them rally the troops. Um, so he didn't want to deny it. But, you know, a lot of things I just said, I mean, it sounds like propaganda, right? Um, but in my research, I found something that I think is, overlooked when it comes to George Washington ghost stories and I think has you know pretty reliable background of sorts so I found this this memoir it's from Josiah Quincy Jr. he was a pretty prominent Boston politician in the early 1800s his father senior Qu Quincy senior was also a prominent politician so I mean I guess I mean if you're looking at it <laughs> from away you can't trust a politician but <laughs> okay. at that time I feel like we could trust these people yeah uh, so he, in his own memoirs, he recalled what he called my father's ghost story. Uh, so Quincy Senior used to tell this ghost story uh, at the dinner table. It was uh, 1806. It's about seven years after George Washington's death. And he was staying at Mount Vernon, uh, which was George Washington's estate. At mm -hmm. the time, it was, uh, you know, it was owned by George Bushrod Washington after his death. Uh, mm -hmm. Or I guess he was like the estate manager or whatever. So he was staying in the guest room that... Josiah Quincy Sr. was in was the same exact room that George Washington passed away in. Uh, oh. So, and he was known to visit the people who were staying there. And George Bushrod Washington actually warned him that that could happen. Uh, and so, his father's ghost story, he doesn't really go into the details of what happened, but he said an encounter happened. And I quote, if uh, he was to the reason why he didn't talk about the details was because if he did, he would have to, quote, go see an expert in cerebral illusions. Uh, so to me, you know, that's a pretty prominent old school um, source that also happened pretty close to after the death of George Washington. And he proposed that the reason why it was is because. Um, George Washington's original crip was deteriorating from all these relic hunters or what he thought yeah. was relic hunters. I actually, I actually have a different theory of why I think Washington, if he did linger, was the reason for it. And it's politically based. If, if you want to hear it, I'm more than happy to tell. Oh you. yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think it actually, I think he was right when it came to the crypt. Uh, so George Washington, he was still in his, uh, in the family crypt, but you know, classic George Washington being George Washington, he had a whole new burial crypt planned for him, Martha, uh, and the family, a whole new nice one to be updated for him after his death. He had all the finances ready and everything for, for it. Uh -huh. Um, uh, but, you know, classic politician that uh, politics that didn't really happen. So he died and, you know, he had this plan to be buried in the crypt. But Martha Washington, his wife, was getting a considerable amount of pressure from Congress. The people, politicians, they wanted George to be buried in the Capitol and she yeah. succumbed to it. Uh, so she allowed them to make plans for it. And he was pretty much in that original crypt that that he was buried in even not the crypt that he wanted to be in. Uh, so for 40 years, his body oh. languished there, mm. uh, almost 40 years. And the reason why is politics as usual. Uh, the politicians, they couldn't, um, they squabbled over finances, yeah. uh, over freaking building materials. Should this be marble or, you know, whatever right. it is. And that happened for 40 years. Our first president yeah. against his wishes, yeah, yeah. um, you know, they, they pretty much, so, uh, you know, there was one last push at the centennial of George Washington's birth, um, you know, some uh, around 1837 to, to make this happen in the Capitol. And then at the time, John A. Washington, who I guess it was owning uh, Mount Vernon at the time, he was just like, screw this, I'm putting this to a halt. And he just wouldn't let it happen. And finally, uh, or, or I guess a few years before 1830, this all happened. And then finally, he put a halt to this and uh, the crypt was built and, and Washington was finally laid to rest in the burial crypt that he wanted 
almost 40 years after his death. Wow. And I think, you know, there's that idea that, uh, you know, you, what people that spirits linger, right. if they have something, some unfinished. You know, business, you know, unfinished business yeah. to attend to. And I think if this was true, that may have been the reason why. Mm. And that's not, you don't really, you're never really going to hear that story. No. Uh, and, and the reason why I heard that story is because for this book, I was doing some research and went down to Mount Vernon Did and, you? and this okay. was one of the stories that, that is told there. And yeah, I actually like saw the memoirs and all that stuff. It's so. told there. And it's okay. on their web. Yeah, it's on their website. You can okay. go to Mount Vernon, whatever the website it is, and it is on their website. I tried talking to them to see if I could get, you know, an official employee to talk about it, uh -huh. but they don't want to talk about it. So I went down to Mount Vernon and I actually spoke to some of the employees there. Um, and they didn't talk to the the story, but yeah, I mean, they confirmed that, uh, to this day, they're still getting some paranormal stuff there. People with sensation of getting touched, uh, of hearing voices, seeing, you know, the bot, you know, bo uh, apparitions of, you know, legs or something like that. So, um, so the stories of George Washington remain to this day and his spirit linger in there to this day. I think that one story with Josiah Quincy Jr. is, is, you know, pretty substantive in my opinion. Mm. So the U.S. Capitol is, is, is that where he's buried? No, he's, he's still, he's in Mount Vernon oh, right I'm now. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I, no, he's in Mount Vernon right now. Um, and just kind of the, another little, in, no, please. No, you go. No, I was going to say that just like while I was there, I found out, you hear all these stories about George Washington uh, and the ghost there. But then when I was there, uh, I spoke to some of the employees and they told me about something that really um, so maybe some paranormal activity that isn't really, uh, known about. So there's an area in Mount Vernon where, uh, you know, the slaves are buried, uh, and supposedly recently at that time when I was visiting in 2014, 2015, that there was some activity being stirred up and it just so happened at the same time they were doing some quasi non-invasive archeological dig there. Mm -hmm. And that's another theory, right? Uh, that, uh, spirits can be con you know can, activity can happen when construction um happens so interesting that that there's some activity there and one that i found out that you know wasn't really talked about that kind of goes with some of the theories of why activity happens right when construction happens yeah no the reason why um i was thinking about the u.s capitol is yes. because there is a book called freedom's gate that was written by my friend William Henry and Mark Gray, uh, who I also know, that stating that or their their theory is that the U.S. Capitol is actually a temple, and the uh, the the painting, the apotheosis of George Washington, that's painted inside the dome. Uh, I am not familiar with it, and I can't really speak to it on an educated, mm -hmm. intelligible level. Well, so because I, I, an apotheosis is sort of deifying someone, and it's George Washington on a rainbow. And they make the case in this book that it is actually a temple to worship George Washington. It's funny because George Washington would not want that at all. Uh, George Washington was a pretty humble person mm -hmm. uh, from all accounts that I've read. Uh, and to deify him is the last thing that George Washington oh. probably would have wanted, actually. Um, so um, I, and I'm not familiar with it, but just mm -hmm. based on that information uh, and, and my knowledge of George Washington, yeah. that I don't know if that's true. Now, that's not up to George Washington, whether who deifies him or right, not. Right. Right. What happened after his death. Yeah. But that's something, in my opinion, George Washington is the exact opposite of what he would want. Well, I mean, we do regard him as the founding father of our country. Definitely. Don't we? Um, but I've always, you know, and maybe that's maybe it's my personal. Opinion. I've never been one to uh, to do that to my heroes. I think the moment you put your heroes on a pedestal is the moment that they're going to let you down. I yeah, mean, George Washington, absolutely. phenomenal human being, but he did some things that weren't right. So he was one of the creators, you know, he helped create the constitution, uh, but, and you know, everybody's treated equal, right. But had slaves. So, um, so there, you know, so there's that. So that's why I think that, you know, George Washington probably wouldn't have wanted that. Probably wouldn't have wanted that. And, and then there's, and then, and, and you shouldn't do that to your heroes because that also tells you, um, in, in your mind, when you put your heroes on your pedestal in your mind, you're telling yourself, I can't do that either. And what we call in Jungian psychology, it constellates the opposite. So whenever we're 
too one-sided about something. So this person is great. They're all good. Um, they can do no wrong. They are the epitome of this, that, and the other thing. Then what happens is the other side gets constellated because the psyche is always seeking balance. Mm. So whenever anything gets too one-sided, the other side shows up. So it's dangerous. It, it um, really is. And and I don't think we should do that to anybody. And, and that's the reason why that there are certain people – um, you know, certain cultures that, that develop where we put people on pedestals that are completely undeserving of it. Undeserving. Yeah. And I think it's because we project stuff onto them that we need and that we want. And that's what humans do. But that's, I mean, yeah. that's a very hum, uh, emotional, you know, that's a very human thing to do. A lot of times from what, you know, from, I think this is something talked about in psychology when someone right. says, you know, someone says, oh, you're such an angry person. Really, they feel, you know, the person saying that feels that they're angry and they're just projecting their own emotions upon you. Yeah, right? that's what they're seeing. They're seeing the, what they're they, seeing themselves in you. Yeah, or what they don't own about themselves. Right, exactly, or lack Th thereof, right. They're going to see it outside of them. Well, is there anything else we haven't talked about? Is there anything <laughs> wow. we haven't? Yeah, I mean, this has been uh, <laughs> it's almost pretty, two hours. Uh, <laughs> This has been pretty, pretty wide ranging, I say. Now, and I think that is a, a, a great, and I think that's perfect because it's a perfect microcosm of my show. You never know what you're going to get. Um, I would say that um, I also talk about conspiracies. Um, yeah. We've done some things about JFK. Yeah. And although mainly the Mind's Eye is podcast, I've done a couple blogs. Um, and I wrote one a few years ago about uh, Martin Luther King. Um, which I think is pretty interesting. I'd love to tell you about you, it if you, you want to touch on it. You wrote a blog piece about MLK? about Yeah, and about the assassination of MLK and yeah, the possibilities of a conspiracy. So I've always been a big JFK conspiracy. I mean, that's the big one, right? Right. Um, and if I'm being completely honest, I don't believe Oswald was the lone gunman. Um, and I think a lot of people agree with me with that now. Um, but... I was never really one to look at the Martin Luther King conspiracy. I was kind okay. of bought into that uh, James Earl Ray was the guy. I never even really questioned it. Um, so I've done a lot of – like I was telling you, I do a lot of research about history. Uh, I do a little bit of road tripping and, and one of these road trips kind of prompted me to to reexamine you know, the MLK assassination and uh, uh, what I kind of came up with was some pretty disturbing stuff that uh, oh. the government was – quite possibly or some faction of the government was behind it. Um, and I'll go into some of the evidence um, just because, you know, when I say when I make a claim, I try to back it up at least. Um, and some of the evidence that I have is it's been out there for a while, but there are from different time periods. And I think not to be you know that guy, but I think I was able to pull it, uh, pull it into one area into this okay. blog. Okay. Um, so I was inspired by my visit to the National Civil Rights Museum. Um, it's in Memphis. And it, that essentially what that was, the Lorraine Motel, where MLK was killed or shot down, uh, they transformed that into the National Civil Rights Museum. It's this phenomenal museum. It's a really amazing um, educational tool. But they were having this exhibition. And you would never think this would be an exhibition from a museum like this. They called it Lingering Questions. And they looked at the potential for numerous other culprits other than James Earl Ray, uh, who could be, uh, you know, responsible for it. Those, they said, mafia, CIA, FBI, Memphis police, they all looked at the possibility of that. And I was like, wow, an educational place where MLK was killed. They're going to say that there's a possibility of conspiracy. Shit, I should probably, probably look into this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so some of the evidence that I found that says, okay, so you don't have to believe me that it's MLK, but how about, what if I told you Dr. King's family believed James Earl Ray that he didn't kill um, MLK because, uh, so uh, James Earl Ray, he was in custody for about a year or so. Um, it was on his 41st birthday. He admitted to, um, killing MLK. Uh, and that essentially was just to avoid a public trial and the death penalty. A few days after mm. that, he recanted his confession mm. and he wrote a letter to the judge. Um, all these years later, the King family, they believe that James Earl Ray, um, wasn't responsible for it. MLK's son point blank directly said to James Earl Ray, Dexter King, he said right to him, I believe you that he didn't do it. I believe you and my family believes you and I will do everything in our power to see you prevail. And they had a, a lawsuit of the same year. So this is actually a legal fact that 
12 jurors, they they said they delivered a guilty verdict that said the government was responsible for Martin Luther King's oh, death. Oh, boy. This is a legal fact in 1999, but you're not going to read oh. that in, in the book. So the King family believe them, right? And, and, you know, that's one little bit of evidence. I'm not going to go over everything, but I'll I'll give you some other stuff that, okay. that, that may say otherwise. And I'll even tell you who I think it is because um, um, I'm not that guy. I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you who I, who I okay. think it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like I said, MLK, their family believes it. Uh, so... MLK father, he came out with a biography. In the biography, he talks about a visit from Martin Luther King just a couple of days before his visit to Memphis where he was shot down and killed. Mm-hmm. And I quote, uh, and this is him, uh, several reliable sources, this is coming from Martin Luther King Jr., mm-hmm. several reliable sources, both private and from within the federal government, concluded that attempts would soon be made on MLK's life, money was involved, professional killers were being recruited with the implication that it was from within the federal government. Now, in the 70s, I believe it was, the HSCA, the United States House of Representatives Select Committee on Assassination, they were essentially created to investigate both JFK and MLK's death. They concluded about MLK uh, that the FBI inadequately investigated the possibility Mm. of government involvement. Why would they in an why would they mm-hmm. inadequately do that? Well, the HSCA also said, and I quote, said about the FBI that they grossly abused and exceeded its legal authority and failed to consider the possibility that actions threatening bodily harm to Dr. King might be encouraged by the program, the program being COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program. Uh, It was a secret surveillance program that was created to destabilize political leaders and movements like MLK. Uh, so if you disagree with the government, they, you would be under the Contel pro. He was under the investigation since the ni- mid 1950s. Uh, so the HSCA said that the Cointel pro, it w- encouraged people to do harm to MLK. I mean, and I won't go into all the taxes. You can read it on my website. Um, so we know that the FBI, they didn't investigate it properly. They encouraged, um, harm towards MLK and mm-hmm. then, on the actual day of MLK's death in Memphis, uh, Frank Hollerman, he was the Memphis Fire and Police Director. That position was responsible for the security provided to King on the day for his visit for the city. That position didn't even exist until months leading up to the King's assassination. And I'll tell you why that's important. So you can hear me. I'm getting around okay. right now. Yeah. Because uh, okay. it, it pisses me off. Yeah, go um, so he unexplainably, Frank Hollerman, transferred black black firefighters who were stationed across the street from Lorraine Motel and who specifically requested to oversee King's security. He transferred them to another location uh, unexplainably on the day of the assassination. You know who Frank Hollerman was? He was a retired FBI veteran. He worked directly with J. Edgar Hoover for 10 years as inspector in charge of the Washington, D.C. office. Of those 10 years, eight of those years coincided with the COINTEL uh, program. So mm-hmm. obviously, but just what I'm telling you, I'm pointing mm-hmm. the finger at the FBI and Hoover. I think there's too much evidence okay. uh, that tells you FBI had something to do with it. Uh, and now I'm going to be that guy. I told you who it was. You know, why would they want to kill Martin Luther King? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to make you go to my website and read okay. it. Okay. <laughs> so themindseyemedia.com, you can read the blog there and that'll tell you why. Uh, and it also has other evidence um, that I just didn't talk about why MLK was possibly assassinated uh, by the federal government. So that's pretty some disturbing information that I think I just shared. And it tells you kind of what was going on at that time. And I believe since that time, we really haven't really recovered as a country. They killed all our leaders that were making a change. They killed all our leaders that were making a change. Yeah. Yep. And whether you agree with Malcolm X or not, he, he had people behind him and he was making a change. And, and there was evidence later on that he, uh, before he was died, he was moving away from that extremism. So Martin Luther King, JFK, RFK, Malcolm King, uh, you know, Malcolm X, they killed all our leaders. And we've never recovered since. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Uh, what do you, okay, so I just gave you that information, right? I'm sure you're going to do, I want you, I prefer you do your own research, see my own information. What do you think? I don't know what to think. I'm happy to hear you out and I would love to read what you wrote because I haven't seen that yet. 
Uh, it's very disturbing. I love being an American. I'm an American citizen and I support our country. 100%. And that's how you support it by getting the, 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 the real information, right? Well, I also I know that, that uh, you know, it's interesting that I have to clear my throat again. Please. Excuse me. And trust me, I don't. I don't say any of this stuff lightly, and right. I don't want to say no, any of this stuff. No, I, I can. But I can this hear is where it in the, your voice. Yeah, but this is where the path led me down. Yeah. So. No, you, you didn't know what you were going to find, and that's what you yeah, found. Yeah, and, and like I said, I know this is like an often way of what people who argue stuff they often start with. Well, I was on the opposite side of the fence, but now I went this way. But that is the truth. I didn't. I just. I had no reason to think that MLK. Mm-hmm. Um, that his assassination had, you know, there was anything nefarious behind it mm-hmm. um, outside of the obvious, mm-hmm. um, that there wasn't anything conspiratorial. But then when you look at the trail of evidence, uh, it paints another picture. Well, I don't like to comment on politics. I, I'm going to stop clearing my throat because clearly it's just going to be like this. So um, I don't like to comment on politics. I don't like to comment on, I don't like to in- say anything disparaging about the government. Sure. Um, my whole family, uh, except for my dad, was born in Italy and came to this country who took them in. And um, I'll always be grateful for that. I also know that, um, you know, things aren't always pretty or rosy. And things are done sometimes that are very ugly. And, um, I don't know what to say about that. It, no, what I was going to say earlier is that over the weekend, um, I happen to be lying in bed and not wanting to get out. And so I turned the TV on and a few good men was on again. It's probably always on some channel. <laughs> and at the very end of the movie, um, I think it's my favorite line of the movie. Cause it, have you seen it? I'm, I'm, oh yeah. I'm you sure can't you handle the truth. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So Jack Nicholson's character says, you know, you effing people, you have no idea Mm -hmm. what it takes to defend a nation. All you did was weaken a country today. And as cold and heartless and cruel as that is, we like to just, you know, and and I go through, I go on walks through my neighborhood and I see these beautiful townhouses and these beautiful residences and I see kids and every once in a while and I think everybody's just kind of living life and we don't think about how fortunate we are and how Sure, and that also God, depends on how who, goddamn who easy to, right? we have it. Yes, and, and that even also depends on who you're talking to. It right? all so depends on who you're talking to. Who, well, then talk about to you know maybe talk to black people about the death of you know Martin Luther King and and the effect that that had on uh, being an American citizen that time. So it's 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 you know I get that perspective, but that's not the the truth is, uh, and that's not the way it is. I get well, it. We live in a fantastic country. What is the truth today? But what is the we truth today? Fantas- even there is no truth. That's the problem. Um, your truth is what you believe. Okay. Um, and, and, and truth has been what, corrupted. Okay, so what are we supposed to do, though? So I'm not – I'm totally letting you have your perspective. I don't really have just, a perspective on this because I don't be know to. what you know. Pretty, yeah, I mean I think it's just – it's simple. Just don't lie to us. Be truthful. But say what here's it is. And thing. I understand there's always a gray area. Listen, I don't uh, – I think there are some times where that's a necessity. So, for example, Operation Paperclip, right, is where mm-hmm. we brought over, mm-hmm. you know, uh, thousands of Nazis over. Yep. And the reason why we did that is we wanted the science information. But if yeah. we didn't do that, then the uh, Russia was going to take them and absorb them okay. and then get the information. So I get it. There's always a time and place where you have to work in the gray area, where there are some times where you have to do bad things for the overall good good killing martin luther king killing jfk that was that had nothing to do with good it only had to do with bad and for greedy uh and horrible reasons and 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 we have uh and because of it uh it's been hard to recover and you can see that i mean there's been minimal politicians since there that you can trust since then and there were before 
Yeah, I think so. Okay. I mean, JFK, he was a piece of shit. I mean, he had his own piece of shit stuff going on. He was, he you was know, a piece of shit. Yeah, he wasn't a piece of shit overall, but he did some things that you could call okay. him a piece of shit for infidelity. Same thing with Martin Luther King. That's why I don't put these people on pedestals okay. because they did things that you could, if depending on what your ethics and morals are, they disagree with it. But they did good things and they okay. did great things. Okay. And the way that they were moving the country toward was for something um, that was for the people. So they they did good things and they did piece of shit things. Yeah. So that's that what sort of, good, it, yeah, you, that's I think you bad. can say that to some extent about all of us sure no of course but you know then there's but then there's the line we all have these lines the line. okay. and the problem is that those lines were crossed with those killings with the killings yeah with the assassination with the of assassinations MLK, right. rfk mlk right and they altered the course of our history exactly right well i think what jack nicholson was trying to my interpretation of what Jack, Jack Nicholson was trying to say in that scene is that we sleep at night and we live these lives in this country. And yes, some people have it harder than others. Um, but if you compare, say, the hardest life in the United States to the best life in a third world country, would they be comparable uh, certain pockets for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, but comparatively on, on, on a mass level, no, of course not in America. Nobody's arguing America is a great country and what we stand for, but because it's a great country, I can say these things. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I get the point that you're making. Um, but it comes at a price the, these privileges we have, these comforts that we have comes at a huge price. Price. Definitely, but I don't think that is related to the assassinations of MLK, JFK, and RFK. Then what was the motive behind that? The motive for FBI is, for for example, J. Ever Hoover, um, Martin Luther King mm -hmm. was, in his eyes, was mm -hmm. starting to, well, I didn't say I was going to say it, but I'll allude to it a little bit, mm -hmm. that uh, there was an idea that MLK could be running for president. Okay. Uh, or would run for president okay. at some point, yeah. or but at worst he had the power to uh, swerve uh, the way people voted, the way people voted, mm -hmm. uh, and Jay Hoover was really afraid of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll and and yeah, I'll tell the rest. I want the listeners to read too. Okay, uh, they'll read about. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and again, we'll have links to that uh, yes. at on the episode page at speakingofyoung.com or you can go directly to Brian's website which is the minds i media the minds i media.com and should we end it there what do you think yeah yeah anything um, else uh, that that that's that's fascinating and it is something that is to be continued and to sure. be thought about uh, it's very serious. Um, yeah, and I want to know what the listeners think about you know read the blog you know read the blog and okay. then tell me what you think. You can tell me I'm way off, uh, or or not. I just I, I love to hear the thoughts and and it, whether you agree or not. Great. Um, now I know Young was big into uh, synchronicity, right? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, and I've had a couple, a few interesting. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about that with you because when I was on your show back in February of 2016, we were talking about synchronicity and I was still very rattled about what synchronicity was and what it wasn't because originally mm -hmm. I wanted my show, Speaking of Jung, to be about synchronicity. I wanted each episode to end with me asking the analyst, what is synchronicity? And then early on, in the in in the the life of the podcast i found out that somebody made a movie called what is synchronicity so i couldn't do that <laughs> and then what i was finding from these analysts is that really everybody had a different answer everybody explained it a little differently so I started getting very confused about what was synchronicity and what wasn't. And you had related a story to me on the episode I did with you. And I said, no, that's, that's really not synchronicity. And that always bothered me because you know what, if it was a meaningful coincidence, if the coincidence was meaningful to you, then it was synchronicity. 
But this this regimented attitude about how it has to be an inner event and an outer event that mirror each other, that's the only, ooh, that's the only, and there goes the, um, what is this thing called? <laughs> what is this thing called that keeps falling apart? The, the popper, pop filter. The popper thing. Okay, so the pop filter is gone. Um, so <laughs> that is the only way that it is technically a synchronicity. I'm sorry. But if no, it is- don't apologize because that's exactly what happened to me. It was an inner and an outer thing. Okay. Because so when after thinking about that, because this act, right. it's funny because this synchronicity didn't happen too long after our interview. Oh, tell uh, me. So, I mean, is that part of the synchronicity? I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's pretty interesting what happened. Um, and it and this synchronicity uh, happened at a time when I really needed it to happen. You know, I was, I guess I was looking for signs. Isn't that always how, how that works? Yep. Right. Looking so I was signs. in a pretty, uh, yeah, I was in a pretty bad, uh, mental rough place. Actually. Um, I was engaged to a, you know, a woman for a long time. I'll, I'll call her Veronica. Uh, and after a pretty lengthy relationship, we got engaged. We didn't end up moving toward that next stage toward the wedding. We broke up, uh, and you know, you can imagine I was, I was pretty broken up over it. I was living in New York at the time. Uh, this was December, 2015 when it all ended. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, when you need a new fresh, when you need a fresh start, you know, where do you go? Of course you go to, you go to the West coast. So I ended up moving yeah. to LA. That's what prompted <laughs> me moving there. Uh, I needed a fresh start at the time, something new go West young man. Right. Yep. Um, so I ended up moving to LA. I was living with my brother for a few years at the time. I owned my own business, uh, doing inspections. So I was lucky enough to, um, to be able to move around and, and still have the business. Uh, so I was there for about, you know, six, I was there for about eight months or so. Uh, and that was, you know, around about a year after the breakup. So yeah, I'll, I'll admit I was still in a, in a pretty rough spot or so. And, all of a sudden, I started getting these calls from my ex fiance's father. Oh. And just due to the nature of the job uh, and the time difference, I either it was either too early for me to pick up or I was just on the job. So I never actually answered. This happened about two or three times. Uh, and, you know, after about two or three times, I was like, ah, screw it. I got to give a call back. I got to know what's happening because you would never leave a voicemail. Uh, so this happened a couple of times over a couple of days. I finally called him back and I was like, what's up? Um, cause this is like pretty close to the one year anniversary when this started happening. Uh, and if I'm being completely truthful, maybe I thought maybe there's some type of reconciliation that could happen. Yeah. So it turns out it was, <laughs> it was nothing at all. Right. Uh, it turns out that he had a new coworker whose name was Brian and he meant to call him this whole time. Oh, my God. Uh, and he was, you know, he was always good to me. So, you know, I wasn't going to be an asshole or, or, or talk any shit or anything like right. that, you know, because I knew he, he wasn't mean to be mean or, or malicious. Yeah. It was an accident. Uh, but, you know, truth be told, I, I probably it probably set me into a pretty rough spot. And this conversation happened in the morning right before I was about to go on some inspections. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for my job, I would go around L.A. and inspect homes. Uh, some of them were pretty high value ones as well, you know, celebrities and all that stuff. Um, so I went to go do a inspection. I'm driving around LA. I'm in the Hills of Hollywood. Uh, I lose all of my reception. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know which way to go at all to get to my next inspection. (laughs) Right. right? Um, Oh God. And I was so angry. Oh, I was (laughs) yelling. I was cursing, you know, at one point, and you know, I combined with the frustration from what's going on with the, you know, the ex fiance's father and everything, the year anniversary, it just doubled down on everything. And I just kind of came to this, this freezing point. I stopped the car. I came, I stopped the car and I just yelled at the top of my lungs, and probably a few words I can't really um, right. repeat here. <laughs> uh, a few tears probably coming down. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so then you know, I'm angry. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. I'm like, okay, I got to get to this uh, to this appointment, right? And I look up. I'm at a fork in the road, and I look up. One street sign says Veronica Way, which was the name of my ex, right. you know, my ex fiance. Right. The other way was the name of the road where I had to go to. Wow. So I could go to the left, the wrong way, the road named mm. after my ex-fiance, or I can go to the right, the correct way. I mean, shit, if I don't know if that's like a, 
I mean, to me, that seems That's like a beautiful. perfect. So, so that actual physical moment of what was happening wow. was reflecting my actual inner, oh, I got goosebumps. inner things that were going on. Yeah. And so that happened and, you know, it started to help me kind of go in the right direction. But oh, just a few beautiful. days later, I had another synchronicity. Oh, same thing. What? Yeah. Yeah. So this is and I don't have too many synchronicities, but this is something that will always stay. I mean, it sends shivers down my spine just thinking about it right now. These things back to back. Okay. So a couple of days later, after this inspection, after the call from the father, mm-hmm. um, I had an appointment for this inspection. Um, and for this inspection, it was a really high value place. So you always do appointments for it. So I was talking right. to this woman, her name was Nicole Trunfio. Uh, I'm not into celebrity culture at all. Even if I was, li- even when I was living there, I had no clue who she was. Uh, she had a, you know, a British accent or something like that. So we set up an appointment, turns out she used this model, right? Um, so she told me we set up the appointment. She said her assistant's going to meet me, um, at, uh, she's going to meet me at their place. Uh, so I, the same day I, you know, so this is a couple of days after everything was happened. I have this appointment. I go to it. I meet the assistant at this, at this Nicole Tromfield's place. I start off business as usual. I do the inspection on the outside. Then I go inside and the first picture I see is presumably her. She's on her delayed honeymoon at this point, she said. Okay. And she is then in the picture next to her is what is now, I guess is, is her husband. And it turns out to be Gary Clark Jr. And you know, Gary Clark Jr., what that no. means to me, I was in this break. So this breakup was happening and I was listening to this one album oh. pretty much on repeat. Gary Clark Jr.'s Black and Blue, which is his oh. breakup album uh, slash like new relationship album. So this one album that was helping me through this thing the whole time, I ended up a couple days around the one year anniversary, a couple days after of this breakup, a couple days after you know, with the ex-fiance's father, I ended up inspecting the house of the person who helped me get through this breakup. Wow. Wow. So those things back to back within a couple of days of each other around the one year anniversary of the breakup, combine those two. I mean, those two things, I mean, like I said, chills right down the spine. I mean, those two things helped me get through and get me on the right path to, to positivity again. And it's all because of these synchronicities. Right. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's it. Well, I mean, what about, what, yeah, so, I mean, what about no, you? Yeah. So, I mean, what about you? I can't, yeah, I can't top that. Let's leave it there. <laughs> it's not a that's, competition. So. No, but that's beautiful. I, I love that. Those are great examples. Those are the best examples I've heard in a long, long time. Thank you for sharing that with us. Pleasure. Thanks for letting me. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we could wrap it up there. What do you think? Yeah. It's going to be miserable to edit on your end for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd be my, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. I think, I think this is a great point. I mean, young synchronicity, mind's eye, speaking of young, I mean, that's a perfect microcosm of all that right there. So thanks for sharing everything with us tonight, Brian. I really loved having you on the show. Thank you. My um, pleasure. I'm feeling a little exposed, but I like it. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a weird feeling, isn't it? Yeah. It's normally I'm on the other side of the mic right. just asking the questions. So thank you. And you had some great questions. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to read the outro now, okay? All right. So please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, and iHeartRadio, and it will be available later on our YouTube channel. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts or TuneIn. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. So with special thanks to my guest, Brian Turnoff, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to a special quarantine edition of Speaking of Jung.